The Rich Eisen Show. Put it all together. Live from the Rich Eisen Show studio in Los Angeles. Kyrie Irving decides, you know what? I don't think I'm going to get that money elsewhere. I'll, 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 I'll just go back. Durant says, you know what? I'm out. Oh, you know what? I'll, I'll just go back. Today's guests, Falcons head coach, Arthur Smith. 15-time hot dog eating contest champion, Joey Chestnut. Four-time Oscar nominee, author and director, Michael Mann. Patriot safety, Devin McCourty. Senior NBA insider for The Athletic, Sham Sharania. And now... It's Rich Eisen. Okay, everybody. Welcome to this edition of the Rich Eisen Show here live from the Rich Eisen Show studio in Los Angeles, California. Hey, YouTube streamers. Good to see you here. YouTube.com slash Rich Eisen Show uh, is how you can watch us if you're listening to us on the Rich Eisen Show Terrestrial Radio Network coast to coast. Thanks to our friends at Westwood One Cumulus podcast network is what puts our podcasts out we say hello to those listening whenever they darn well please the podcast is available where all podcasts can be acquired odyssey streams us live day to day year uh, year in and year out now um and to those out there who have been hopping in our four five seven chat room <laughs> and also tweeting us at rich eisen show or talking to us uh, we are going to be back on sirius xm radio in short order our move from peacock to roku also moved us off of Sirius XM, the station that we've been on, uh, and we are finding a new home, and that's going to happen in short order, and we greatly appreciate everyone's patience. Again, we're moving to Roku in September, um, and we're very excited about that because it's going to be streaming free on all Roku devices, as well as Samsung Smart TV, Fire TV, any mobile device. You can get that Roku app because the Roku channel is free on it, and then the RokuChannel.com for anybody who wants to stream us from a desktop that is your right as well. We're very excited about the future of the Rich Eisen Show and thrilled that you're here with us here on a very busy Wednesday. We're five wide on our guest list, but three wide as always here in studio. Uh, across from me, Chris Brockman, good to see you, sir. What's How up, are you? Rich? What's hanging, brother? I am doing well. Jason Feller is sitting in for hey. DJ Mikey D, is in D's nuts. And then the uh, the snapping <laughs> of the lighting of the candle, that's uh, TJ Jefferson. Good to see you over there, sir. It's How are you? good to be you? seen, Rich. Good to be seen. Very good. What a what a Subway Series finale last night. Were you locked into it as much as I was Bro, last I night? I was like, I <clears throat> told you. game, huh? I, last year, I would have turned that game off. I would have been like, this game's over. But that you top of the night. You got a great night, team, man. The Mets are a really, really good bases baseball Bases loaded. Team. You had to be feeling it a little I bit. I was f- feeling it. <laughs> oh, my God. I was living and dying with every pitch. That was a hell of a baseball game yeah. and a great atmosphere with Yankee and Met fans all, you know, mixed up with one another. And the teams are just, uh, you know, the Yankees are, are, are not uh, the better team right now, but they were the last two nights. Know, you guys seem like you're turning it around. I don't know. A we, sh- we shall see. We shall see. What's and baseball? Is that a is that a sport? That's <laughs> I know that it's a that? game I with know. a ball and a bat. Oh, weird! Never heard of it. I know. That's I know. The Red Sox are deep buried. <laughs> That's bizarre. Deep and buried. Well, uh, Terry Francona has his Cleveland Guardians atop the uh, division. In the American League Central now. I, so. I really haven't beer. cared about baseball this deep into the season for in about while. three, four years well, now. Well, welcome so. back to that, yeah, sir. Thank you. Welcome Thanks for back having to me. that. Let's go, Mets. Um, so uh, on this program, we've got five guests. Uh, Devin McCourty, um, who is the, I guess, the longest-lasting McCourty twin. He wins the, the last longer contest right. <laughs> in the tournament known as the National Football My League. hands on hard body. Uh, he'll, be, that? he'll be joining us from uh, New England uh, practice. In Las Vegas. Is that the case, huh? That's where they are. That's where they are in Vegas, baby. Uh, Interestingly enough, uh, a lot of people have uh, uh, Patriots on the brain in Vegas, and we'll get to that in a second, not just because of who's practicing there. Sham Sharania will join us and uh, tell us what what happened in that meeting with the Brooklyn Nets and Kevin Durant and the owner and his uh, wife and the – general manager and the coach that Kevin Durant apparently said had to go for him to stay and they're not gone and neither is he what do they tell him like what what deal does one strike to get him back in the fold hook line and sinker what do you what do you do because they didn't touch his contract they said it's a partnership did they enter like a, a TV deal with with his group I have no idea but they used the boardroom logo yeah, on the that's team the partnership I know I, yeah I noticed that so I'm just wondering what what in the world happened there? Yeah, sure. Why not? That is the phrase as well. <laughs> the rallying cry of the twenty twenty two, twenty twenty three 
Brooklyn Nets, as we said yesterday. On a t-shirt when, soon. When Kyrie's like, all right, I'll hop back in. And Durant's <laughs> like, I want out. And I'm not coming back unless the coach and general manager are gone. Okay, the coach and general manager are gone. So I'm thinking of retiring. And then I will deny that I'm not ever going to retire. And then I'm just going to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Very Costanza like Rich. <laughs> with Ben Simmons and everything going on there. That's the new uh, rallying cry for the 2022 2023 Brooklyn Nets. I sent uh, that video of uh, our releasing the sh- yeah, sure, why yeah, not, sure, why not? Uh, phrase to uh, to Bobby Cannavale. Oh, nice. He's very, he's very, I think he's very pleased with himself and very pleased that we have. Yeah, one of his we finer moments. Him, yeah. He always has one or two. Yeah. So um, at any rate, so Shams will be joining us in hour number three. In uh, in just about 15 minutes' time, Arthur Smith's going to join us. And it's always an interesting chat with the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. Not only because, um, you know, he, he just always shoots you straight. He, he, he has come out in the front door, uh, I think the last time we, we chatted on this show, he thinks every single question I have has some sort of uh, mechanism within to trap him into <laughs> saying something that I want to click for. Like a hidden meaning, yeah. like you're fishing. Like right. I, I don't know what, I, what he is, it is. He is flat out said. Yeah. You know. So um, we approached that interview. Um, we're going to tread lightly, to use the phrase of our Monday guest, Vince Gilligan. Should we just ask him what he thought of the plot of Castaway? Uh, no. Okay. I imagine. <laughs> is, that, is that in reference to the fact that he's from the FedEx family, the yes. FedEx founders family? Yeah. I think that's that, that it's too many dots to connect there. Okay. All right. So I'm there's... glad that you connected those. I mean, it's just a fascinating story with him. Is that, know, you know, I mean, he could do whatever he wants. He did not have to go this route. I mean, nope. he, the grind and the slog of becoming an NFL, NFL head coach. coach like, I know. Did not have to do that. He did not. <laughs> could have taken a desk job. He could be know? the Wolf of Nothing. Wall Street. He could literally be on a beach right now. <laughs> but he's not. As a matter of fact, he's getting ready for the uh, opener against the New Orleans Saints. How about that as a first, uh, first up? Falcons Saints, one of the best rivalries in the NFL that nobody talks about. They do not like him. They either. certainly do not. <laughs> they do not. Um, and Desmond Ritter looks really good, man. So we're going to talk to him about his rookie quarterback and the decision to go to Marcus Mariota and Kyle Pitts, year two for him. Arthur Smith's coming up shortly. Also on this program, the this book in my hand uh, that everyone on YouTube.com slash Rich Eisen Show can see, Heat 2. It is a novel that is the sequel to the 1995 hit movie Heat. And the author is the director of Heat, Michael Mann. At age 79, he's got the best-selling novel on planet Earth. He also directed the pilot of Tokyo Vice on HBO Max that's been picked up for season two. And he's over in Italy right now directing the movie Ferrari with Adam Driver and Penelope Cruz and Shailene Woodley and an all-star cast. Wow. And he's going to... Join us on this program to talk about why write this book. And we're going to play a Heat celebrity, true or false, with him, Chris, that a lot of some of your questions will get answered. Oh, can't wait. Pacino, De Niro stories, it's all coming up. I was watching a little Heat the other night. In hour number two. And then uh, top of hour two, don't miss this. But uh, as we mentioned yesterday on this program, um, we wanted to talk about the hot dog beer straw guy with the man who is the all-time champion hot dog consumer. And I don't mean purchasing. I mean, he literally (laughs) chows them down in two bites. The great Joey Chestnut will be on this program to give us his thoughts on some Yankee fan using a hot dog as a straw and if that is a foul of some sort. And yes... As we discussed on this program yesterday, uh, Rich Eisen Show digital coordinating producer Sean Mitchell did, in fact, attempt to do this with a Dodger dog in Dodger Stadium last night. And, yes, Jason Feller, you did, after calling this a genius move, attempt it yourself uh, on the porch of your beautiful, um, I guess, South Bay manse. Yeah, I've uh, certainly been enlightened. Okay, very good. So we'll have that all for you on this program. Man, I was going down some of Joey Chestnut stuff real quick, Rich. He has 55 world eating records. Eggs, asparagus, <laughs> donuts, tacos, hot dogs, meat pies, 
gyros, fish tacos, pepperoni rolls, burritos, gumbo. This guy ate 1.8 gallons of gumbo in eight minutes. You guys understand what that does to your insides? Uh, I can only imagine. I he's can amazing. only imagine. He's, one, he's maybe our greatest athlete alive right Do I now. ask? You can have Giannis. You can have Tom Brady nice. and LeBron. Nice. You can have Connor McDavid, anyone doing CrossFit, any of that. Cra- Give me Joey Chestnut. <laughs> okay. What if it's a new game fantasy team? Ten. New fantasy team name, Joey Chestnut's colonoscopy. Put it in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna, like a box of chocolates. Are we going to start doing you major never, league eating you fantasy? You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> okay. So, um... Let's just hit on this subject matter because Derek Carr touched upon it yesterday. The quarterback of my oh. Las Vegas Raiders. <laughs> it's my quarterback. It's my quarterback. Quarterback of my Las Vegas Raiders. Yes, he's got his boy blue back. Old school. Devontae Adams, the two Fresno State Bulldogs getting together in Las Vegas as they've apparently wanted to do. For quite some time, his brother David came on this program and said that they've been talking about it for years. And it almost happened a couple years ago, which was a nice little eyebrow razor for those in Wisconsin. But it's happened. They're there. And so is Chandler Jones. And so is Josh McDaniels. And I think the world of the Raiders opportunity this year. And I think they're going to snatch that AFC West brass ring. I don't know what they'll do with it, how far they'll go. But I think they're going to win this division. And... Um, and certainly this team has had a nice little go of it right now. Thank you. A nice Mm -hmm. little go of it right now because last year was such a year of upheaval with Gruden, uh, with uh, Henry Ruggs, with the way that they made the playoffs, (laughs) with that last second field goal to knock the Chargers out, even though a tie would have put them both in to almost knocking off the Bengals in Cincinnati in the playoffs in a game where there was a touchdown that was allowed even though Joe Burrow was kind of out of bounds. And then Mike Mayock gets fired, then Rich Passaccia is not retained, then Josh McDaniels arrives, and then everything that has happened since then is allowing me to feel, all right, this is the team in the AFC West. And then comes, I can't believe I'm saying this, Dana White. <laughs> Along comes Dana White and the Gronk cast of the UFC 278 right there in Las Vegas, Nevada. And um, Dana White reveals he was brokering a deal for Brady and Gronk to go to Las Vegas. And Brady was even shopping for homes until Gruden backed out at the last minute or got cold feet or didn't want to do it. And um, even I who is high on Derek Carr and the Raiders, was saying, what was Gruden thinking? What was Gruden thinking? Because it's the same thing with, just in my profession, like for any announcer who's dreamt of calling an NFL game and hearing that Amazon was creating Thursday Night Football for itself or taking Thursday Night Football for itself and creating a new, completely new platform for Thursday Night Football, and they reach out to Amazon saying, I'd like to, I'd like to call Game 3, please. And then you find out Al Michaels is the one that they choose. You're like, oh, okay, I can understand that. Now, I don't think you refer to him as that MFR, but, you know, that's the similar situation. Brady's available. It's just like, oh, okay, I get that. Unless he's taking your job, that's a different situation. And now Derek Carr, after everything I just set up, He was a leader, a team leader with everything that happened last year. And now everything is like smooth sailing and all of a sudden comes, yeah, you know, the Raiders were all set to move on from you a couple years ago. That's something that can rattle a cage, can it? But not Derek Carr's. I mean, it it is what it is. Uh, You know, for me, like, I didn't even hear about it. Uh, We actually had within the building someone lost a family member so like i was so immersed in that and just talking to that person and that kind of stuff that uh, it really was 
it, it was a moment to really put things in perspective. Like, it really doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Um, at the end of the day, anything I say will just be blasted out there. So I'm just going to completely remove myself and just keep trying to play football. It's been nice just answering football questions. Uh, you know, and hopefully, hopefully no more drama in the city. That's what, that's what I hope. That's what he hopes, you know. And by the way, for those listening on the radio, that was not Cole Hauser from Yellowstone. That was <laughs> Derek Carr. By the way. Sounds just like him, doesn't it? <laughs> Sounds just like him. Literally, I heard that sound by just a couple minutes ago. Mike Hoskins, our CP, played, played it for us uh, beforehand. I'm like, who does that sound like? That's really good. Rip, baby. That sounds just like Rip. Sounds just like Rip. That's and that right. sounds just like Derek Carr. Yes. But smart move. I'm not going to add a single ounce to this news cycle. Nope. I'm not going to do any of that. I was too immersed in being a good human to even now wade into the deep waters with the undertow known as the 24-7 sports news conversation cycle to even pay that any mind. And it makes sense because what's he going to say? Gruden's gone. Mayock's gone. Brady's won a championship. He's still down in there in Tampa. He's got Devontae Adams, and he's got Darren Waller. By the way, could you imagine a Darren Waller, Rob Gronkowski, two tight end set at the disposal of Thomas Edward Brady? Can you tell me what that would look like? Why are you doing that What would that look like? Why are you doing Well, I mean, not to bring up the past, but they had a similar situation in New England, and they went to the Super Bowl. I understand what you're saying. So... I got you. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. skill sets. Oh, my God, is all I'm saying. Yeah. It would have been But, 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 Derek Carr is still there. They got McDaniels. They got the guy who was Brady's play caller. I know. They got Brady's play caller for Derek Carr and Devontae Adams, and they have Waller, and they've got Hunter Renfro. They're set. So what else does he have to say? Derek, that's why I'm here for you. (laughs) Hit it, please. What were they really thinking? Now, this is where I normally say what I think somebody's thinking. Derek Carr c- truly could be believing what he's saying and thinking what he did, in fact, say. That does sound he like a Derek does, Carr yeah, thing. But just in case he does have a little bit of this in him, Derek Carr would like to say the following. Are you kidding me? <laughs> How many times do I had to prove myself around here, folks? Okay. I understand I don't have all the rings of Tom Brady. I understand I haven't really done very much around here when you compare my resume to Tom Brady's or Rodgers or any of the so-called elite quarterbacks. But when it comes down to putting points on the board, you now got me my guy from college who, I might add, helped me become a second-round draft choice for this team. And even with Jack Del Rio, Mr. Dust Up himself, I was an MVP candidate before my leg got snapped in half. I've been there and I've done it. And guess what I'm going to do here for you, Las Vegas? I'm going to take the pieces that are still around because Gruden did believe in me. And he looked at me and maybe he thought I was Nathan Peterman for a second, but I'm Derek Carr. And I'm going to lead this team to a championship. With my guy, Devontae, and my guy, Hunter, and my guy, Darren. What do you want from me? I'm part of the community. I'm part of this team. I'm here for you. And I've survived all of it. They still haven't got me here in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm here. He's not. Deal with it. And see. Do you think that's what Derek Carr is really thinking? Probably not. Okay. It seems like he's way too nice. Yeah, no. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> not at all. Yeah, that's just the New Yorker to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that's literally what, what's happening. And I, want, I, I, I want good things for Derek. So do I. Man. Yeah. So do I. So do I. But, I mean, wow. That I, I can't wait to, whenever Gruden does talk, that's a great question to ask him. What were you really thinking? What happened? Oh, man, I'd love to know. So would, I guess, the realtor that thinks I'm going to get a nice percentage from selling a house to Brady. <laughs> then what? The Booch and Brady. That person, was, that person might have been the most disappointed of all. Two Gar- and a half, two and a half percent commission on what? Brady yeah. house. What's I'm the commission off a of $30 Brady? million dollar estate in Vegas? I'm going to get to put that on my website? Sell the house to Brady? No, 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 Rich. You're uh, forgetting the better half. 
Let's take Giselle. a break here on the Rich Eisen Show. <laughs> 844-204-RICH, number to dial. When uh, we come back, Arthur Smith, the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons, will be here on the Rich Eisen Show. Back here on the Rich Eisen Show here on our YouTube.com slash Rich Eisen Show stream as well as Odyssey. Once again, we're moving our show in September to the Roku channel. And a fresh, friendly reminder, it is free. There will be zero paywall for you to see this program with a Roku device, a Samsung Smart TV, an Amazon Fire TV, a cell phone, a mobile device. Any mobile device you want to put the Roku app on, the Roku channel is free on it. And so is the stream that will be at the RokuChannel.com for all of you desktop viewers out here in the 21st century. The Rich Eisen Show coming to Roku and back here on the Rich Eisen Show, one of our favorite guests. I say that a lot about people, but uh, and, and sometimes I don't mean it. I'll be very honest, but I do mean it this time. Uh, I do mean it. No, I mean it every time. What's the matter with you people? You said it. No, I mean it every time. I mean it every time. I'm a very genuine guy. Uh, and so is this guy in his second year as head coach of the Atlanta Falcons, joining us here shortly before kicking off the season. He is none other than Arthur Smith on the Mercedes-Benz Vance phone line. How are you doing, Coach? Great, Rich. Uh, good to talk to you. I appreciate the compliment. Yes, sir. And uh, I'll have to download the Roku app now. So, Will you do that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You sold me on it. I, <laughs> you're buying what I'm selling? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a great sales job. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. You know what? You should make it mandatory for the team. What do you think? I'll make it mandatory. But maybe, you know, I'll, I'll put a little poster outside the team meeting about downloading it with your ad on there. I'll get uh, Batsy and I will make a little poster I, for you. I appreciate that. And then uh, if you want to um, ask uh, Mr. Blank to put it in all uh, Home Depots, if he still has that juice, let's do that too. What well, do you think? see how this interview goes. And uh, <laughs> so. Always evaluating me. I always feel like you're evaluating me. <laughs> I always feel like you're evaluating me, uh, Coach. I'll be very honest, but uh, all right, let's jump into it here. Um, so what is your evaluation so far of Desmond Ritter? Let's get right down to the brass tacks about this very talented Bearcat who came out of the draft evaluation community uh, as a player that was maybe the most pro-ready coming out of Cincinnati. Coach. Well, I mean, really, I'm pleased with uh, both quarterbacks. I think Marcus Mariota is at a, a terrific camp. Um, and Desmond's, he's, we've been pleased with Desmond. Um, there's some silly things. I mean, he's, he's making progress every day, but I'm very pleased with both quarterbacks are at, and, uh, they're saying we're going to push Desmond to improve. Him. Well, I saw what you said about how you think Desmond can take hard coaching. What gives you that impression or what gave you that impression that Desmond Everybody's can different. handle that? It's not a shot at anybody. Else. No, I know that. Everybody's wired different. And, right. um, but it's part of the thing that I like about Des, <clears throat> you know, he's, He's a tough kid, um, came from a tough program. I think Luke Fickle in Cincinnati, they do a terrific job. And I like the way he's wired. But everybody's different. I've coached all different players. And you got to find different ways to reach them. No, I understand that. Is there a specific example of, of how you sussed out that, that Ritter could take it, whatever you might be um, spooning out? It's not really that, like, bravado he take it. It's just kind of the way it, his mental makeup. And there's a lot of work. There's a lot of mythology and, and fluff that goes in the pre-draft process. But once you really get to know the, the person, you know, what his personality is like, and then as a player, uh, what makes him tick, uh, that, that's when, to me, it's you find out the best way to coach. And so uh, you've got, uh, as you mentioned, Marcus Mariota uh, at the top of your quarterback flow chart. And what an mm -hmm. opportunity that he has in front of him. And toughness is not usually a word that is associated with him or his game, but I, I think it is. He's he's one tough he's one tough cat. 
certainly when he's running the ball and throwing it as well. What do you th- see in him that fits and suits your style of play, Arthur Smith? Well, he's in a different spot. I mean, we all continue to, to grow and learn, and uh, very excited to, to work with him again. I think the experiences, you know, some of the hardships he went through in the last couple of years, it's only made him better. I think the time he spent out in Vegas was beneficial to him, and I think he's got a new look and a new lease on life, and he's taking advantage of his opportunity. And, and both those guys are – it's a great room. Uh, they're fun to coach, and so we feel pretty good about where we're at right there. Arthur Smith, Atlanta Falcons head coach, here on the Rich Eisen Show on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line. You tell me if this is too simple a line to draw, but you are you came from – the Tennessee Titans, offensive coordinating an offense that had Tannehill at the controls. Do you see Mariota with that similar skill set running that same type of offense uh, as, well, as well? Do you see that, well, Rich, Arthur? We've evolved. You know, I think you, we have some core beliefs, but we're going to continue to evolve. And so when Mark has walked in here, it wasn't the playbook from 2019 when we were together. Mm-hmm. Um, we've, we've advanced. And I think you got to play the strengths of your of your team and your players, you know, around those core beliefs. No different than we did in Tennessee. They're, they're two different players, but certainly there's some things we can do uh, with his skill set, moving and and whatnot that we're excited about. Do you find that? I mean, do you ever sit back and just wonder how things work? About how here you are with Mariota in Atlanta. You're the HC. He's now your QB one. Does that ever strike you, Arthur? Well, I'm not the most nostalgic person. I mean, one day. Um, you know, when I, I can look back on some things, I mean, I, you know, sometimes, you know, it's it's cool. I mean, that's why all relationships along the way, whether you're on your way up or way down, it, it relationships matter. And um, you never know. I mean, life comes full circle sometimes. I thought you don't get nostalgic about our conversations. You don't sit around saying, I haven't spoken to Richard. Only, only when, when uh, David tells me that uh, <laughs> I got a chance to come on, then I'm like, yeah, well. I enjoy going on here, so see what he's selling, and yeah, here we are. And I always do appreciate that. So what about you in terms of self-evaluating yourself from year one to year two as a head coach? What what do you did you glean from that and are bringing into year two for yourself, Arthur Smith? Absolutely. There's a ton of things you, you learn along the way, you know, things that um, you learn, you know, how the building operates, uh, what, you know, that you learn a lot about the players that, that are already here, uh, that you're coaching. And and, the, and there's just so much, and even the first time going through a training camp and setting up the season and what you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, certainly this camp's been a lot different than last year's camp, and we'll continue to look at it every year. And so what about, uh, is there anything specific to last year? You made a note, like, okay, I'm going to be better at this sure. next year. What do you got for me, Arthur? Well, certainly, um, you know, we had our reasons why, but, you know, we didn't play guys in the preseason, and whether that's – the perfect answer or not, you know, mm-hmm. that's a debate around the league, but you got to do what's best for your own team and where you're at. And you evaluate that every year and where we're at right now with some of the youth we have. Um, we felt it's been necessary for our guys to get out there and play to get ready to, to go. What's uh, the scoop with Drake London? How's he doing right now? Doing good. Doing well. <laughs> okay. Is he going to be out there week one, do you think, for you? Rich, I'm not – I'm not – I'll let you guys do the prediction. Uh, I just – you know, listen to the advice of our medical team, and, mm-hmm. and we'll see where it goes. Can I can I help you out with that answer, Coach? Because I like leaving you in a better you spot. Try. Can I do that? Let's see how good you are. That no, uh, there was a very there was an opportunity for you to use one of my favorite coaching cliches, and you 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 could have used it, and I would have been very appreciative of it. What's your, what's your favorite one? I don't have a crystal ball. You know, you could have used yeah, that. Yeah, right you know there. that one gets played too much. I just kind you of, think so? Oh. Do you, yeah, you've yeah, been around in coaching ranks. Have you ever seen a coach with a crystal ball? Have you ever seen a crystal ball and a coach? I have not. Yeah. Okay, there I have you go. Not. So nobody does have, in fact, have that. Somebody okay. might. Okay. Somebody might. Somebody might. Okay. There's characters in this business, Rich. So somebody might. Never know. You never know. Okay. So, uh, what is your thinking on uh, the new emphasis, apparently, that's being placed on? illegal contact down the field. We had the former head of NFL refs, Mike Pereira, and the lead Fox rules analyst on our show. And he's, he, he was giving our fans a heads up, look for a ton of flags, maybe away from the play um, that uh, the league wants thrown that did not get thrown last year. What are, what's your two cents on that subject matter, Arthur Smith? Well, the 
good. And Mike's a good guy to do that because he gets paid to talk about the rules. Like I can, I can complain or, or agree or disagree, and it's it's wasted energy. When they ask you, you know, our opinion, I'll give it to them. But once they make the rules, we're going to try to, you know, you coach understanding what the emphasis is at. So it's a wasted energy whether I agree or disagree with that. All I care about, tell me what the rules are so I can coach it the right way. You're in, you're, you, so you're, you're basically in midseason mode right now with me. I feel like that's... Well, I'm ready to go, Rich. <laughs> so what is it? What, okay, then give me, your, give me your mindset for a game day then. Like when you say you're ready to go, what, what is, how do you get ready to go? Like what's your process, man? Well, it's every day. Process, you man. Know, when, you, when you come into work, you know, I'm thankful for the opportunity. I mean, I, I think the longer, you know, sometimes I think players and coaches, you get jaded the longer you're in this business sometimes, so you fight how lucky you really are to get to work in the NFL. And so I remind, it's about perspective. I remind myself, so when I come in here, I'm, I'm excited every day. Uh, this team's fun to coach. Um, we got Jacksonville here practicing with us today. I'm excited about that. And just the progress, continue to try to make progress. So that's really why is I'm ready to go because every day I'm thankful I get the opportunity to come do this. Okay, and so you will plan on your final preseason game to play your guys as much as you're – you're able? Is that because uh, I'm just well, trying to say? Really. It's, it's, we've already played our guys, and, you know, some guys will make a decision on how these next couple of days go. But last year, I didn't get any of those uh, veterans and presumed starters reps. And I, you know, philosophically, I, you know, we knew why at the time and where we were at with the roster and them, with all the young guys we had that hadn't had any experience, maybe I overestimated with some others. So we take the team this year, and, you know, we wanted to get them ready to play. We've done two joint practices. We've had two preseason games. And then I'll assess at the end of the week, whether preseason three, whether we need to play everybody or not. And a lot of it will depend on how the rest of this week goes. Do you ever get a, a little, uh, you know, look or a high sign from Arthur Smith before, uh, from Arthur Blank before a Saints game? No. Which is the way you no, no. you never get one no, of those? No, we communicate like... all the time. He's been unbelievable to, to work for. Um, love working for him and Rich McKay. But, you know, we talk communicate and uh he's been terrific but there's is there do you circle the saints game do you do that sort of thing like college do you do that sort of thing coach uh you know i just look at what's in front of us and you know it's such a long season they're all big and that's a, that's the beauty of the nfl is how important every game is um we know they're a terrific team they got a lot of they, they got a lot of good talent they they're going to be a pain up front so we'll have our work cut out when uh, new orleans comes in here but we're excited we're, we're ready to get out there and compete. We got to again. I don't want to jump too far ahead because we got Jacksonville first. Coach, look, uh, I appreciate the call. I always appreciate you taking my call um, and chopping it up with me, and um, and I appreciate the support of this program. And um, as always, I appreciate it. Thank you for the call. No, I appreciate you having me. I love coming on here. You know, it's a good thing. Do you ever have Mike Vrabel on here? Uh, I have. Had Vrabel on why? Yeah, ask him about his predictions. Uh, he may have a crystal ball. So why don't you ask him? I'd love to hear what his answer would be. If you ask him if he's right. got a crystal ball. He told me once to take my heart pills and buckle up. That's what he told me. That was the. Oh. That, <laughs> that was. You should ask him. I, I you have him on. Say that I told you he had a crystal ball because he, he loves predictions. Okay, comparison. I will yeah, say that. I will definitely say that yeah. to him. And, and sometimes I, I think he rolls his eyes when he sees my phone call because I'm a Michigan guy. I think that's a problem. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. But I'd just love to know what his response is going to be. He's a grudge holder, I think. Certainly, he doesn't <laughs> want to hear from me after last November either. So, maybe not. But I'll definitely do that. I'll do that. Coach, oh, I appreciate that, Rich. take care, man. Be well, and we'll chat, we'll chat during the season. Thank you, Coach. Oh, appreciate great. it. That's, that's Arthur Smith, everybody. Atlanta Falcons head coach. Already in mid-season mode. He really is. He's got, yeah. I mean, he just. He's locked in. He shut every door I tried to yeah, open. I know. You did a good job. Did I? I'm just trying to pump you up. I feel, I feel like I feel like I went through a 12 round fight. <laughs> a lot of rejections. So it's like high school for you again. A lot of Dikembe's. Yeah. Wow. Like high school. Wow. You know what? I uh, take offense to that. You should. <laughs> but highly accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I was Casanova. I'm just saying. I was the Archie Griffin of my high school. <laughs> Double high. Yeah. Back to back Heisman's. Yeah. <laughs> hey man, it is it is funny that Mariota was the guy in Tennessee, mm -hmm. and then they got Tannehill, and Tannehill became the guy in Tennessee, and it went so well 
that Arthur Smith became a coaching commodity. And now there he is in Atlanta where they knocked on the door of Deshaun Watson, right? Yep. Now that's a door he would have slammed in my face in two seconds flat. (laughs) Because even he, when I said to him, like Desmond Ritter, because he said I'm coaching him really hard, he can handle it. I want to know, like, how do you, how can you tell when a guy can uh, take the coaching? Right. And he's like, I'm not, you know, criticizing others. I'm like, no, I don't think you are. So how do you think you would have handled the Deshaun Watson conversation? So they go and knock on Deshaun Watson's door. As we all know, Deshaun takes the Cleveland door, and I'm sure Atlanta is kind of happy about that based on how we're seeing how that's all played out in Cleveland. You don't think they'd like to have Matt Ryan back? I don't think that was a fit any longer, sir. Best player in the history of the franchise. I don't think that was a fit any longer, cap-wise and roster-wise. And if I was Matt Ryan, I would have wanted to swing from one vine to another as well. Because I don't believe Atlanta, with all due respect to what Arthur Smith and... No one's expecting them to make this. And and the rest of the Falcons organization... Is cooking up. Yeah. I don't think they're going to be in line to win a championship for at least another year or two. And that might even be an aggressive timeline. Yeah. And timeline. also just like, you know, Matt's close friends with Matthew Stafford and just seeing what he did going from the Lions to, to finding a new home in L.A. and immediately had uh, success. They won the Super Bowl, as we all know. So, you know, I, I, I don't blame Matt Ryan for doing right. what, he, what he did, but I'm just saying, you know kind of forced his hand too by them True. or flirting with Deshaun Watson. Right. And and with um Ridley out and Gage gone yeah. and Drake London now there and Pitts now there and Cordero Patterson clearly going to be the the engine of that offense. Yeah. And what Smith built in Tennessee with Tannehill, now he's got a quarterback in Mariota who can do the same thing, which is, hey, it's inside the 10. You have no idea. Is he going to keep it? Is he going to throw it? Now, Patterson is not Derrick Henry, but he's uh, quite the... Load. Well, he's he, he's quite the... He's, he's a big guy, but he's also the Swiss Army knife. You have no idea what he's going to do either. This is, I think, a much less predictable offense than what Atlanta was throwing out there last year where Ryan was getting his ass hit and pounded. I think it's worked out for everyone. I think so, yeah. And um, I just think it's interesting that Arthur Smith's now an HC and look who he's giving an opportunity to be the number one quarterback again in the NFL. And Mariota could do this. He could tell Desmond Ritter, "You're, you're, you're not going anywhere. You could think I'm crazy, but the NFL works this way. He could turn uh, Ritter into Jordan Love if he performs the way that he can, and obviously the weapons need to step up and stay healthy. He doesn't have a crystal ball about Drake London. (laughs) I think Drake London could be a monster. I think so, too. Kyle Pitcher looked good in the first uh, couple drives there against the Jets on Monday. So, you know, we'll see. Let's take a break here. The PGA Tour had a press conference to announce their new changes. And many of their changes sound very familiar. Not just because of what they appear to be copying, but also that the changes were requested by people who are no longer on the PGA Tour. Which matter bring, bringing about the changes we're talking about. That's all coming up next right here on the Rich Eisen Show before we have a whole load of guests coming on the other end.
let's get into um, uh, the fact that this is Atlanta. I love it. Okay. This city is so beautiful, man. This, is this city is so dear to my heart It, it because I chose it. I had truly never seen African-American people in such roles and positions and titles that I had never seen in my life. And it blew my mind. You know, city officials, doctors, lawyers, political figures. It blew my mind. So I said, that's where I want to go because I knew the dude I was. I was non-apologetic. I was brash. I was going to be me. And I felt like Atlanta would at least understand me. And I said, I'm not going to you. Don't draft me. I'm going to play baseball. If you do, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. And <laughs> sure Atlanta, enough, Atlanta was number fun. five pick. I was so happy. I didn't know what to do. Man. And, and, and I also love the story that you've told. And if you wouldn't mind uh, telling the audience here as well, uh, at the combine, when you would be pulled into rooms. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you didn't know which room you were being pulled into by which. Yeah, room. yeah, I was, I was, I was. You know, it come back in not, back in that day. Everybody yeah. was reaching for it. Agents was in the hotel. Yeah. Everybody was everybody. It now went, it now went, it's all it, yeah. scheduled. It now was you scheduled know. structure. You can't be in a hotel. You can't be on the premises. Then it was everything was wild. So I'm backing away from crowds and people trying to grab me, and I backed into this room, and the Giants was there, and it was the Giants room, and they had people sitting down taking these test. What do they call these things? Oh, yeah, like the psychology yeah, test, right? I mean, the thing was that thick, man. And they, I sat down, and they gave me this thing. And what is this? They say, it's this test, and you know, we need you to take it. I said, oh, what picker do you have? It's like the 10th. I said, oh, I'll be, be going for it then. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> so I got him and walked out. <laughs> I'd be going. Well, I'd be way going for it then. And, and then <laughs> let's just get into it here. I mean, Belichick said he watched you run the 40 at the combine and that you ran it and then ran into the tunnel. And is it true? That's not true. Okay, you did not run into a waiting car and being taken no, to the airport no, right then and there. No, because I had more interviews and all of that. No, that, that story just grows and it grows. It does, it's like yeah, a fish yeah, story. Yeah, it is, it is, it, that's not true. I did everything that I was asked to do. Now, I didn't lift, I ain't do none of that because Jerry Rice to this day had laid across my arms and had me bench pressing. You know, I, I don't know where that comes from. I love that you say that when, when you're watching the defensive backs I, I put hate up the that. weight and reps of 225. Why? struggling to get the fifth one up. You're when like, have you you ever said, man, well, if that guy would have got one more rep, he would have been there on that play. <laughs> Never. Of the three-cone drill. Like, no, this has nothing to do with nothing. So I didn't do any of that stuff. Right. Yeah. Well, it all worked out. Yeah. The one and only brilliant Deion Sanders, when he appeared on the show in front of a studio audience at the Super Bowl in Atlanta prior to the Patriots and Rams taking on one another. Back here on our terrestrial radio outfit, as well as YouTube.com slash Rich Eisen Show. Callaway has a family <coughs> of golf balls called, pardon me, <coughs> Chrome Soft. The great Chrome Soft family of golf balls by Callaway. They didn't just make the best players better. It's made everyone better. Men, women, first-time major winners, repeat major winners, club champions, business golfers. The Chrome Soft family is the best tour performance for every type of performance. Starting with the regular Chrome Soft, which is designed for the widest range of golfers who want better feel, more distance, incredible forgiveness. For better players looking for more workability, that's the Chrome Soft X. That's for you. Excellent spin consistency, tour level short game control. The Chrome Soft XLS finally gives you a lower spin golf ball and longer shots, firmer feels, still within a high spin around the greens. Basically, when you add it all up, it's pretty simple. Chrome Soft is better for the best and better for everyone. Find out which Chrome Soft is right for you at CallawayGolf.com slash Chrome Soft. 844-204-RICH is the number to dial to have a conversation with us. The uh, director, Michael Mann, he wrote uh, Heat 2, the sequel, and also a little bit of a prequel. So this novel, Heat 2, is not only picking up where Heat left off, which is the um, the Val Kilmer character, as you remember, Chris Chihurlis. He gets away. Spoiler alert. Yeah. And uh, he's holed up in Koreatown, all banged up. Yeah. And Vincent Hanna, the... Al Pacino character begins the search for him. So it's kind of like Better Call Saul, where it's a prequel, the story that leads up to Heat, as well as what happens after Heat. That's Heat 2, and that's why this novel, Michael Mann wrote it, along with the author Meg Gardner. That's why this is the number one bestseller on planet Earth. Number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Love it. 
and uh, we've got a great heat celebrity true or false for him that you're going to love, Chris. No question about that. Very excited. That's coming up in hour number two, as is Joey Chestnut. <laughs> That's why I love this show. Michael Mann <laughs> and Joey Chestnut. Michael Mann as well. I mean, I could have spent an entire hour with him. I Zoomed with him. It's going to be a great conversation that you'll see. Um, do you know, he, he wrote for Starsky and Hutch. The TV show? Yes. Police Story, which was the um, Angie Dickinson-fronted police television show. Vegas. He created Vegas. Dan Tana, Robert Urich. He wow. created that show. Crime Story, he wrote and executive produced, and he was also the EP on Miami Vice. Jeez. So he's clearly been into the cop um, genre. He also, though, directed some brilliant movies, Last of the Mohican. Uh, Last of the Mohicans, he, he directed The Insider, which also started Al Pacino yeah. about the 60 Minutes story. Uh, Jeff Wigand was the, um, <clears throat> the guy who blew the whistle on the tobacco industry. Yeah. And um, he he directed that. He also directed Ali. So there's some great Ali stories coming up. That's coming up in hour number two of this program. Yeah, he's a heavy hitter. So... We've been talking about this for weeks, ever since the Live Tour came into being and started poaching some bold-faced, big-time championship players from the PGA Tour, which appeared to be caught completely flat-footed, basically telling these guys, you're taking all that money from the Live Tour, don't expect to get your tour card back. And ever since then, the issues that Phil Mickelson put front and center that kind of got lost in the shuffle of his comments about the Saudi royal family and he's never going to join. He has problems joining the Live Tour because of their bad mofos and things of that nature and everything else he was saying around it that caused, as we learned subsequently, the PGA Tour to suspend him. It seems that all of the issues that Phil was bringing to the fore the PGA Tour is addressed and is continue to addressing. The PGA Tour announced that top players from the PGA Tour are committing to compete in at least 20 events starting next season, including 12 elevated tournaments. What does that mean? Well, the purses are going to be 15 and 20 million bucks. That's still, you know, a mere bag of shells when you're talking about somebody getting a hundred million just to play just to join a tour but not everyone's getting that from the live tour but this is apparently what came out of that players only meeting we spoke about with alan shipnuck from the fire pit collective last week tiger woods and rory mcelroy hosted that players only meeting prior to the P B uh, bmw championship last week and they've all rallied around each other and Rory McIlroy said, I'll read this quote here. We've all made a commitment to get together more often to make the product more compelling. When asked about how this is going to be affecting things moving forward with the Live Tour. Ready for this, Chris? Ready for this quote? What do we got? I don't have a crystal ball, he said. Nah, Rory. <laughs> is Rory's going to coach in the NFL now? Is that what's happening? But I think everyone in that room felt this was the best way to move forward. And the PGA Tour members, the top players to be determined by something called the Player Impact Program, will commit to playing at least 20 events next season, including, you know, the Memorial, the uh, Players Championship, the Arnold Palmer, the Genesis that's out here in Los yep. Angeles, the uh, Majors, as well as the Century TOC, and then the FedEx Cup Playoffs, the St. Jude, the BMW, and the Tour Championship. And uh, more money's coming. And there's also, get this, is there a team event that's coming up as well, Chris? Starting in 2024, Tiger and Rory have uh, had this new joint venture that they're uh, a tech-infused golf league that's going to take place in, like, football stadiums. It's basically kind of going to be like Top Golf on steroids with simulators, and it's going to be on Monday nights. It's kind of going to be awesome. Okay. So, as well, the PGA Tour is launching an earnings assurance program for fully exempt members, guarantees a league minimum salary of $500,000 per player. Now, that's the floor, right? 
Yes, yeah, so that's like against winning. So that's the, kind of your basic. You got to participate in 15 events to get that. Rookies yeah. and returning members are going to receive the money at the start of the season. So hey, everybody. Yeah, kind of upfront. All those folks that are joining the live tour and are guaranteed money, even if they finish 54th in the 54 hole, hole event, yeah. there's no cut there. Here's some money. Yeah, guys are going to get five thousand if they even just if they miss a cut. Uh, and the tour is going to subsidize travel and tournament-related expenses for the players. And it's funny you mentioned Phil. Like one of Phil Mickelson's biggest gripes against the tour is he claimed that uh, Jay Monahan and the tour were sitting on this big stockpile of cash that they weren't sharing with the players. And now, out of the blue, the tour has all this money to pump into the league, you know, pump into the events and and create all these elevated events. And now we got the team thing coming. It's like. Okay, so maybe Phil was right. <laughs> you know, Player impact program. So that's been going on for a couple of years now. It basically, it's kind of like social media interaction, guys who are helping grow the game. Uh, last year, I think Tiger uh, was the, in first and got a $10 million bonus. So that, I think that's being doubled now. From and it, $50 million to $100 million. Yeah, and they're, in, and they're making it from the top 10 players to the top 20 players now. So that's another thing for guys to earn extra money throughout the year. So is that why Alan Shipnuck tweeted out today, Phil was right? Yeah, and it was funny. He responded to someone who was like, yeah, Phil was right, but he doesn't get to reap any of the rewards of this. And Alan Shipnuck responded, Shakespearean. Jay Monahan was asked if uh, anybody who left for the Live Tour seeing all these changes says, you know what, that's, that's what I was looking for. So let me come back. Would he allow it? Here's his answer. Jay, if a player who is gone off to live looked at this and says this looks pretty good would you lift the suspension and welcome him back no why not they've joined they've joined the live golf series um and they've made that commitment and they've and for most of them they've made multi-year commitments so as i've been clear throughout um every player has a choice and I respect their choice, um, but they've made it. We've made ours. We're going to continue to focus on the things that we control and get stronger and stronger. And I think they understand that. Mm, their lawyers might not. And, and does he respect does their he choice? Does he really <laughs> like, respect I, it? I don't really think that's true. but I think he should be forced to go hire a register on that. <laughs> I respect it. <laughs> right. I don't think he respects their choice at all. At, at all. But he banned them. He respects so. their purse and knowing yeah. that there's no competing like even all of this money that has been added and I'm sure fans are sitting here and it, it's just like when the baseball salaries started exploding and you're a fan and you're just like it's it's like you can't relate as a fan, you just can't relate as to all that money. Oh, great. So the people who are already flying around in their Lear jets are now going to get all this more money. They're, they're being respected by the tour, you know, and, and now I'm going to root harder for these rich people because they're being enriched more. And it, it's a tough thing for a fan to swallow, but the bottom line that a fan has to understand is if this is what's going to keep them on the PGA Tour and that's the method of golf that you enjoy watching and the, the format of competition that you're used to or, for, or or like watching or you're just an old school individual, this is the way to keep them, I think, yep. because the Saudis and Greg Norman might be sitting there thinking, oh, really? You're just adding that much? <laughs> Did you check out Aramco's second quarter profits. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> That's nothing. So if the Liv wants to fight fire with fire, there's going to be a lot of money flowing. So we'll see what happens. I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, and someone know, said it's so, just like the tour trying to buy loyalty, and like I think that's fine. Like, well, you, it's you, the, ha you have to get all the best players – in the same events. It's the same thing, though, that 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 Daryl Morey once said here when he was a, a, an in-studio guest. I think he was still with the Rockets. And I said to him, you know, how do you deal with the fact that a player could just turn around and say, I want out, and you have to oblige, even though the Nets just took a stand with Durant that was successful for them for the time being? 
and we'll talk to Sham Sharani about that in hour three as to what they told Durant to put that genie back in the bottle for the time being. But I asked Maury, how do you deal with that? And he's like, I love it because it's my job to make sure a player loves it here and my, with my organization so much, they'll never ask for the trade. Right. We'll win here and we treat you right. You'll, you don't want out. And I guess that's the way to do this here. Like, hey, we're going to make sure, like, yeah, $5,000 to miss a cut. Is that life-changing money for somebody that needs the tour to also provide child care services when the, 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 the player is on the road with their baby? Not so much. But if, you imp- if you're going to now say, we'll pick up your first-class travel for you, your spouse, your kid, we'll cover the ch- child care costs, we'll do that, and then suddenly that player spikes to a top 10, top 20 status, they'll remember, we assume, what happened on the way up that they were taken care of. And the live tour comes knocking, and it's just like, well, where were you when I was 150th in the world? And, you know, my, you know, my travel was picked up and I didn't have to worry about child care and I didn't have to worry about health care. Where were you? Now suddenly I'm good. You want to you wanna enrich me? I'm with the PGA Tour. Maybe that's part of the process here. You know? So... That could be part of what the PGA Tour is doing here. But to fans in general, it's just f- funny money. It's just, I, I mean, yeah. It's a, so, so the player that used to get $10 million in the, in, the, in, the pip. in the PIP program, the player impact program, now you get $15 million because you're trying to grow the game. Oh, okay. Right. Now the, the, tur- the, the pursers are now uh, $50 million more. Oh, oh, okay. All I care about. All I care about is that the players don't leave and that the tournaments that I enjoy watching have the best players. Have the best players. Yeah, that's all I care about. But I'm just wondering if somebody, part of the Saudi royal family or Greg Norman seeing these numbers and go, okay, you should have added another zero, pal. Because guess what we're going to do? And, then, and, and they and might it, do that. And so but. instead of growing the game, it's just growing bank accounts. And I don't know if fans really care. We just want to see the events that we love to see in the format that we've grown up loving and understand it does put the players to the ultimate test. Four rounds, 18 holes each. You got to make a cut, <laughs> you know. I just want to see that filled up with all the bold faced names and some, give me some great golf and – So the PGA Tour did what they had to do. We'll take a break when we come back in just less than a minute time right here on Odyssey and YouTube.com slash Rich Eisen Show. The great Joey Chestnut and the not-so-great Jay Feller's attempt at drinking a beer (laughs) through a hot dog. Rude. That's coming up next. Eisen Show. Put it all together. Live from the Rich Eisen Show studio in Los Angeles. Kyrie Irving decides, you know what? I don't think I'm going to get that money elsewhere. I'll, I'll, I'll just go back. Durant says, you know what? I'm out. Oh, you know what? I'll, I'll just go back. Earlier on the show, Falcons head coach Arthur Smith. Coming up, 15-time hot dog eating contest champion Joey Chestnut. Four-time Oscar nominee, author and director Michael Mann. Patriot safety Devin McCourty. Senior NBA insider for The Athletic, Sham Sharania. And now... It's Rich Eisen. Hour number two of the Rich Eisen Show is on the air right here on NBC. Oh, pardon me. I knew I'd do that. Right here on YouTube.com slash Rich Eisen Show. The number of times 
I would go on NFL Network in the beginning days of NFL Network and say, Welcome this is Sports Center. Center. I, I did it all the time. <laughs> well, that's the two years after Peacock. I knew I would do it every now and then. Um, but uh, we're not on Roku yet. That's going to come in September. The Roku channel is free, and you can get it for free on any Roku device. If you've got a smart, uh, a smart TV from Samsung, it's sitting right there. And the Roku channel is free. The same on an Amazon Fire TV. That is free. You download the Roku app on a mobile device. It is free to download. And so is the Roku channel to watch on your mobile device. And then if you are sitting in an office, we had so many people saying, hey, it's uh, too bad you moved uh, to Roku because uh, I love watching you at work. Well, we're assuming you're doing that on a desktop. And uh, the Roku channel is available at therokuchannel.com. And it's free there, too. And we're starting in September. We'll give you the exact date in short order. Uh, 844-204-RICH is the number to dial here on this program. The director of the brilliant movie Heat in 1995, here in 2022, Michael Mann decided to write and publish a sequel. Heat 2 is the number one bestseller atop the New York Times novel best-selling list. And he is going to be joining us in about... 15 minutes time right here on the program. Sham Sharania uh, will be joining us in hour number three. He's the one that first popped out there the news that everything was back in order in Brooklyn, that Durant was no longer demanding a trade, and he's back, and Shams will be joining us in the studio, uh, pardon me, at the top of hour number three to tell us how that happened and what the Nets said to Durant. And then coming up uh, after him, Devin McCourty steps off of the practice field in Las Vegas where the uh, Patriots are getting set to take on the Raiders and they're practicing together. McDaniels and Belichick can't quit each other. (laughs) They can't quit each other. Never. And so that is uh, another order of business that will be um, discussed with Devin McCourty when he joins us in just uh, about an hour plus time. So we kick off hour number two, recapping our top story from yesterday. (laughs) Somebody at Yankee Stadium drank a beer through a hot dog. That was our top story yesterday. This gentleman decides to pop a hole in the top and bottom of a hot dog (laughs) using a straw, doesn't waste the innards, sucks them out. Even though he doesn't use the straw, he uses the hot dog to drink the beer. And a lot of people think it's fake. But you could see some of the beer going down. You could see some of the beer going down a little bit. You see the beer going down. But uh, you yesterday, Jason Feller, took the approach that um, drinking the beer through a hot dog, using the beer as a makeshift straw, was in fact genius. We put up the poll question, is this man a madman or a genius? And the final results of that was a It finally came through, 82% madman. Over 3,000 votes. Exactly. And you, Jason Feller, said, you know what? I think it's genius. I'm going to try it tonight Yes. at home. And at that point in time, uh, chiming in from his home where he works uh, expertly handling the digital (laughs) process of the Rich Eisen Show, which is uh, anybody who sees all these videos on YouTube right here as soon as it's over, uh, they don't get get done unless Sean Mitchell's handling it. And Sean Mitchell uh, decided to try it himself. He said, I'm going to do it in Dodger Stadium. He's going to do it in an actual Major League Baseball stadium. And I predicted you can't do it with a Dodger dog. Now, people here in Los Angeles love their Dodger dogs to the point of they're mad. They're mad men about it. They're crazy. If you ever say the Dodger dog isn't all that. Oh, they go nuts. People think that. Oh, blasphemous. blasphemous. you, you, You might as well change staples to crypto. (laughs) That's how they handle it. Like you're, you're, it's an affront to them. And I said, you know, a Dodger dog is too thin and the bun around it is too, it's, 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 it's kind of like wet. Like the, the heat of the, the wrapping just totally makes it thin and it makes it very difficult. I said, you're not going to get it done. So here's a video. Sean Mitchell, you could see it. The hot dog's already falling apart. The straw is like midway through and he tries to jam it through and then it comes out the middle <laughs> and it's just, it's just, it, it I mean, he couldn't even get he couldn't even get halfway there. Blame it on the straw. Blame it on the hot dog. But he just decided we're not doing it. And um, it, it just I'll be honest with you, for those on the radio, it looks like a freaking catheter. It just doesn't look good at all. Honestly, 
And you don't you, you shouldn't turn baseball fans into urologists <laughs> on the spot. So he just aborted the mission. Over. 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 Done. You, however, Mr. Feller, you created the video, but you didn't yeah. you didn't show us punching the top and the bottom of your hot dog that you boiled. You boiled the hot I, dog? I boiled it, yeah. Okay. You boiled the hot dog. And um, here is the result of Jason Feller having already punctured the the wiener, by the way, which is I do believe a uh, the the second album after Smelling the Glove by Spinal Tap. Uh, this is the fruits, if you will, of Jason Feller's labor. All right, so this is take two because it turns out that uh, it's not that easy to put your straw through, and that guy was been a pro. So I got my Hebrew Nationals here, sticking with the tribe. And a Heineken. So, second attempt here. The first one, I got nothing out of here. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so once gross. again, there's nothing coming through here. So, it feels disgusting. It's starting to taste disgusting. And it is disgusting. So, I don't need to do this ever again. Thank you for watching. There you go. That's your TED Talk yeah. right there. Thanks for coming <laughs> to the, the, uh, the J Talk. So, um, no longer genius, right? No. You don't think it's genius anymore? Not at all. Horrible. I think it's fake. You think it's fake? Yeah. It was oh, so hard to get that goodness. straw through there. Took multiple yeah, this straws. Guy, this guy just popped it in and popped it in, but it was much thinner. You guys used much thicker straws. This guy, it seemed like one of those like stirrers from a, a coffee cup. I don't know mm. if it's in the, I don't know if it's in the, I mean, it could be in the hand motion. It could just be, maybe this guy's a surgeon. Maybe he's just used to using his hands delicately. I don't know. But all I know is the man used a hot dog as a straw. And when we talked about this on the show yesterday, we, we were saying we need one man's opinion on whether this is a foul. If this is, in fact, a blasphemous use of the hot dog. The man who is the champion of planet Earth of consuming hot dogs in the shortest amount of time, the champion eater. Right, Chris Brockman? Correct? He is the greatest competitive eater in the history of mankind. Joey Chestnut here on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you doing, Joey? Doing good. good. Good to be on with you. Okay, so did you see this video of this gent using the hot dog as a straw and sucking a beer through it? Have you seen this video, Joey Chestnut? Oh, I've seen it. I, I was uh, I was shocked and amazed also. Okay. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it's ridiculous. Okay, so what is your thoughts, sir, as a man who has made his name uh, on many foods, competitively eating them, but the hot dog being the one that's you're most known for? Your thoughts on the use of the hot dog in this manner is what, Joey? Oh, it, it's uh, just just because he can do it doesn't mean he should be allowed to. Uh, it, it's it just because he might have those special hands that can do it. it, it it's ridiculous, and uh, yeah, it, it's. I, I think. Oh my God! I mean, I, I've eaten some gross things, and I've eaten I've eaten hot dogs in weird ways. So I, I don't judge people very often. But that that's just uh, that's out of line. Have you ever Have you ever um, used the hot dog for anything other than just eating it, Joey? No, no, I haven't used it to help me eat other uh, other things. Or, or but uh, yeah, it, it's it, it, it's. Dang it, man! I I catch myself because uh, I do we- weird things. I, well, and I I dunk the buns in water to help them go down. Fast. Yes, you do. So uh, so it, so it's hard for me to. Uh, I I usually don't cast judgment, but uh, <laughs> it's still wrong. So it's still wrong to use it as a straw. So if it, instead of it, that was our poll question yesterday. Genius madman is this guy a genius or a madman? You would have voted what? Oh, Ge- madman! I don't know. So is the competitive eating world up in arms over this, Joey Chestnut? Is it? I don't think we're up in well, up in arms. Uh, so up in gullet? It, but, are you up in gullet over it? Is that what it is? Up in esophagus it, it, over it? It's not, it, Joey. It's not turning our stomachs or anything. Uh, but we, yeah, I, I think we, I think I think it's going to go away. I, I think, uh, <laughs> and, and you know what? I'm a little bit curious. I want to. I want. I kind of want to know what the beer tasted like going through the hot dog, the hot dog straw. Will you do this for me then, Joey? If even though you have said you're you're offended by it. Would you attempt it? Would you at least attempt it, video it, and send it to us so we could see Joey Chestnut do it oh and, and tell us your opinion of whether, in fact, you've had your opinion changed or not? Will you, oh, will, will you, you, will you do that, Joey, for us? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll give it a go. I'm going to a Cubs game tonight. Oh! And, uh, oh! 
<laughs> so you're going to do it in yes. Wrigley nice. Field? You're going to do it in Wrigley Field? I'll do it in Wrigley Field. Oh, oh my oh. God. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Can you you have to you have to send it to us at Rich Eisen Show, and then we will we will see. And you gotta you gotta include your thoughts. You gotta include your thoughts if this works or not. If this is something that you uh, would endorse, a Joey Chestnut blue check mark or not? Will you do that for us, please? Okay. Yeah, you know what? You're, you're, this is the way to do it. I, I, I shouldn't knock it without trying it. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm gonna give it a go. Well, do your do, you, do yourself a favor. Take your time. Don't rush it. Okay. <laughs> Take your time. There's no there's no contest here. We just needed to again, we've attempted it and it might just be the straw being the issue. Um and I don't think clearly it'll be your your intake. That won't be the issue. You've never seemed to have a problem with that. But we need to see that, I'm Joey. Maybe maybe if I can cut the straw at an angle and that way I can oh, kind of uh, rotate it to almost saw through it. See, you're, you're the genius. genius. You're the you're you're the professional. Clearly right here that's not a bad yeah. idea because then then it then it can actually get in there interesting yeah like, it's like a needle like you, you wouldn't have a needle that doesn't have an angle on it oh man 15 time nathan's hot dog eating contest winner the greatest champion competitive eater of all time joey chestnut you are going to attempt this in regular in the friendly confines oh, I mean, what are the play <laughs> what an better? iconic what spot place? an iconic spot are you a cubs fan or are you just in chicago i'm just going to chicago yeah what are you eating there? Where do you... Oh, what am I doing? I'm judging a, a hamburger uh, cooking contest, and they're pairing the hamburgers with a uh, Sutter Home wine. So okay, we're gonna. I get. I get. I'm gonna be eating burgers, drinking wine, and then uh, eating a hot dog with a as a straw. I love yeah. it. This will be great. So you know, I have just a couple questions for you, Joey Chestnut. I've always wondered. Now that I have a, a, an opportunity here, so when you just go out to dinner. Do you do you have the urge to eat it fast, or can you actually savor a meal? Can you do that, Joey? I, it's weird. Like I, I'm not eating like contest speed, but I'll, I'll I'm definitely eating a little bit faster. It's like it's like a race car driver driving on a nice ro- road. Right. It, they're 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 not going to drive exactly the speed limit. They 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 like they like the way the car feels. They like the way the road feels. Okay. They're going to go faster. I, I I like I like the I like to eat. And uh, when it's tasting good, it, um, it's it's going to go down fast. Okay, so you can't. So it's. Do di- you have difficulty savoring what you're sitting there and eating? Um, what I mean, a, what about this? Yeah. It, Sorry, Joey. Go it, ahead. It, 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 yeah, I would. I, I mean, I'm never going to let the food get cold. Understood. I, I, I I'll, I'll slow down for a restaurant situation. What uh, about? But, uh, yeah. <laughs> socially, you, you so you are you are socially decent eater is what you're saying. Socially. Yeah, yeah, I can hold back. That said, uh, Joey, let's say you are, are you married, Joey? I'm engaged. You're enga- I'm engaged. Okay. <laughs> okay, engaged again. Okay, very good. Don't rush the altar, obviously. Um, so um, so let's just say you and your, uh, your fiancé having a meal, your food comes first. Do you wait for the food to arrive for, for your fiancé before you start, or do you just see it and you just got such a – a Pavlovian reaction. You got to consume it on the spot. Joe. No, no, I'm I'm a gentleman. I'll, I'll definitely wait. <laughs> a professional and a gentleman, <laughs> Joey Chestnut. Yeah. Okay. Those are those are other issues I have. Uh, questions. One, another one is: Is there anything you won't eat competitively? Something you're just like, I just will not do it. What do you think? Oh my gosh! Every every year there's a contest in New Orleans, one of the best cities in the world, and uh, it's it, it, and I and I love I, I want to go to it, but it's uh it's raw oysters and I I just can't bring myself to it. Mm, is it the consistency? Is that what it is? It's it's the consistency, the salt, and just the thought. I mean, I I can have a couple oysters, especially when you put uh, some lemon on there and some salt, uh, and some sauce on there, and some hot sauce. But uh, but eating in a contest, you know, it would be like it'd be like ten pounds of oysters, mm. and the, just it would be gross. What? Uh, okay, I hear you. What, what does a seventy fifth hot dog taste like, Joey? Oh my God, it tastes like victory. Only one person on the planet that's eating seventy five. It tastes like victory. Well, victory. we we will be uh, flying the W tonight to use a Wrigley phrase. Once we receive your video, Joey, of you doing what we saw in Yankee Stadium. And either agreeing that this is, in fact, a good way to use a hot dog 
even though you currently don't believe so, or it confirms your belief that this is a blasphemous use of a hot dog by consuming it as a uh, beer, using it as a straw. I can't wait to see that tonight, Joey. I'm going to give it, yeah, yeah I'm going to give it a try. Okay. Well, good luck on Labor Day. You're, you're in the ma- one of the majors, right? One of, one of the season's majors, the Buffalo Wing Fest. Oh, yeah. The Buffalo the Wing Eating. Yeah, in, in, in Buffalo. Yeah, uh, it's Sunday, la- la- Sunday before Labor Day. It's, uh, yeah, it's Buffalo Wing Fest, Buffalo Wings. Last year, I, I lost by two wings. Mm, yeah, so Mik- uh, Miko Sudo got you by two. Right, you had two forty-four. Right. Unbelievable. She ate two forty-six. Yeah. My gosh! And then on September twenty-fourth, you're going to compete in the Cases Pork Roll Eating Championship in uh, the seat of power of New Jersey, Trenton, um, and you're defending your title of forty-five pork rolls in ten minutes. Is that true? You got that? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That that, that one's it, it. Yeah, you only get pork roll in New Jersey, and it's actually pretty delicious. Mm-hmm. And you're fresh off of a twenty-four ounce. Well, 32 24 ounce cups of popcorn in eight minutes at a minor league baseball game. You set a record there, too. That just happened a couple oh, of days yeah, ago. My, just last night, I, my mouth is still raw from it. it, uh, it gonna, all those kernels are actually. I was going to ask, <laughs> you got something in one of those back motors? It came up during this chat, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been, I've, I've lost twice since then, and things are still coming out. Joey, I, I appreciate you uh, taking the time here. And in advance, I look forward to seeing that uh, video tonight. Uh, at Rich Eisen Show is all we ask. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. It sounds like it, we got this. We're all gonna right. Do it. We got it. Yes. We're going to be looking for it. <laughs> Joey yeah. Chestnut here on the Rich Eisen Show is going to drink a beer through a hot dog at Wrigley Field tonight. You're welcome, Cubs fans. You're welcome. And somewhere, looking down from heaven, is Harry Carey saying... I wish I could do that. Oh, my gosh. Let's take a break. Let's go from this to Michael Mann. (laughs) (laughs) What a segue. Let's talk heat. We'll talk heat when we come back. We've been around the block a few times, Christopher, you and I just doing this thing. So many times. And TJ, you've been part of this program since Jump, although um, off camera for the first few years of this program. But you're you're well-versed in what we've done here and the work that we've done here on the Rich Eisen Show, correct? Right? You got to turn your microphone on. I guess that would help if I wanted to. (laughs) Right? You know. (laughs) Um, Would this be our finest work? Joey Joey Chestnut? Joey Chestnut, of all people. Okay, if if two days after and he, this and goes after, viral, he just we happened to you and I you were thinking of his name. I said it. TJ was like, "Man, you guys know each other a long time." And then <laughs> that's true. We get him to call in the next day, and it turns out he's going to a Cubs game tonight. That game. Yeah. Uh, I mean, kismet. It's really meant perfect it's meant, storm, guys. In the wrestling world, this is known as long term storytelling. Is what we're doing. But right we here. did it all in the course of twenty four hours. <laughs> well, in in the world it. of Judaism, it's called beshirt. Okay, <laughs> you have to explain that God one. Bless you. That's it's a phrase of it's meant to be. Oh, the shirt. Go. Let me write that down. The shirt. This was the shirt. Be shirt. Yes. Oh, please let. This when happen. Susie and I went to our uh, our rabbi, uh, our rab, we visited our rabbi prior to our uh, marriage. The rabbi was Johnny Silverman's father. Okay. 
and uh, he had a copy of uh, Johnny Silverman was the cover boy of Beshirt magazine. The had actor? No idea. Yes, indeed. That's a real magazine. Had no idea. <laughs> had no idea that magazine existed, but it made sense that Johnny Silverman, a nice Jewish boy, would be on the cover. That's the second That's time meant in to be. two weeks that Jonathan Silverman's name has been mentioned. Johnny also. Silverman is one of Susie and I's favorite people on planet Earth. <laughs> I was and his father married us. And then his oh. father signed the wrong line of the marriage license, and Susie got a call. She'll tell the story. You guys legal? Are you saying it's she, not? For, for about 24 <laughs> hours, she was legally married to Johnny's dad. <laughs> <laughs> Have her tell the story next time she's here. Please. So, so I don't want to know. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Have That's Susie incredible. tell the story right, next time she's out. in this seat, because she tells it better than I can. This, welcome to the Susie Silverman. Yeah, I wasn't the one who received the call from the New York City Department of Marriage or whatever the hell it was. <laughs> she did. Yo, that's crazy. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, man, that's funny. Yes. So. And boy, did she take Johnny's dad for everything in the divorce. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, when Ryan Leaf was here, I, I don't even know how we got on it, but yeah. we were talking about a trip I took to Costa Rica, and I said I got to the hotel, and the first thing I saw was Jonathan Silverman walking around in the robe on the on our floor. And He's just one of the greatest, <laughs> most delightful human beings ever, ever. So that's that's why we yeah I mean we'll 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 always talk about Johnny. <laughs> I met him for the first time on the field in uh, Colorado. At uh, uh, at Coors Field for the Major League Baseball All Star Game that was there, I think in ninety seven, ninety eight. Okay, he was part of the celebrity event that was beforehand. Oh yeah, man, go way back, and you know, his dad boxed me out after marrying. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> it was Bashert, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Bashert. <laughs> <laughs> Back here on the Rich Eisen Show Terrestrial Radio Network, we all love the movie Heat. So when this book, Heat 2, came out and hit the bestseller list, we said to Michael Mann, would you like coming on the show? And he did exactly that from Italy, where he's on the set of his new movie, Ferrari, star-studded film. Here's my chat with the great Michael Mann. Joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show is a very busy man who is in the midst of a terrific year after directing the pilot episode of Tokyo Vice, which has been picked up for season two on hbo max but in addition to that joining us from italy where he's directing his new film ferrari amidst having the number one book on planet earth for best-selling novels heat 2 the director of heat from back in the day and the author of heat 2 michael mann how are you doing sir i'm doing very i'm doing well thank you i would definitely say you're doing well i mean you're having uh you're having a terrific year congratulations on that no, thank uh, you. Me- let me just jump into it. Why, why Heat 2? You know, you you wrote it with Meg Gardner, um, but why yeah. jump into this at this point of your career? Um, well, it never really left me. I mean, I never, the, the characters were, were are, uh, vivid. They had vast lives before the events of the 90, 1995 film. Uh, I was always fascinated about, you know, how to project them further into the evolving transforming nature of uh of uh you know professional organized crime the way the world works in 95 is not the way the world works in you know 2022 or as far as that goes 2000 when when this when the sequel takes place 2000 2002 in other words those 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 patterns of transnational organized crime, for example, were emerging. The dark web was emerging in 2000, 2002. So um, um, basically, in, in a word, the, the movie Heat is a slice of these lives. And there's a, there was a lot before and there's a lot, a lot after. So um, and what tends to happen when you go as deep into characters as I like to, and as the actors I work with like to, they really become alive. They become their own kind of living entities. And uh, so you never really, you never really leave it. And so the story in, in the novel picks up uh, where we left off, or at least part of the story does. There's flashbacks. And of course, there's the present day as well. 
where Al Pacino's character, Vincent Hanna, is searching for Val Kilmer's character, who, as we all know, um, his wife gives him the high sign to not come upstairs at the end of Heat, and he ends up escaping. Is right. that is that a story that you, you've had in your brain ever since the end of Heat? Is that is that what you... No, that, no, that, no that, that part's new. What, what, Heat makes reference to Hannah's work in Chicago in, in the in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it says he went after Frankie Yonder at one point, who was a, uh, was a home invader, not this home invader, not, not Wardell. And, and you know, as I research other projects or, or you're working through things, you find arenas, whether it's Batam or Ciudad Leste, which we location scouted and did some shooting in the Miami Vice. And so all these 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 things are kind of rattling around and and the idea of driving this story into it with particularly particularly the Shaharlis character because Shaharlis was postmodern. The the, the uh, Bill McCauley was very much a modernist kind of character. He had rules and regulations for himself, and if he deviated from them, the outcome was bad. He almost determined his own fate. Uh, because it got spontaneous. And once it got spontaneous, he made the mistake of going for Wang Rao. And that undid him, in effect. So her list just seems to skate on by. So in that sense, he always felt to me very much like a character for the new millennium. And so the idea of um, of Shaharlis, and I can't divorce him from Val Kilmer in my mind, the idea of Shaharlis moving forward into a whole new area where where it, everything changes. When I say everything changes, it's like as good as these guys were in 1995, they were basically being 19th century bandits holding up banks. So the sophistication of what they did was no different than, it could have been the 1880s, they could have told the same story of bank robbers. Um, but when you move into the new millennium, everything's different, you know, through the through the zeros and the odds, and um, and, and to sort of bring this push the, to push the story, the stories into this you know exciting new world, this territory that to me was is is, is unexplored and very very exciting, exactly for that reason. Michael Mann, the uh, director of Heat, and now the author, co-author of uh, the new top best-selling novel on planet earth at the top the new york times bestseller list heat two here on the rich eisen show so you are very well known for your research going into a film and before i dive headfirst back into heat uh i i do want to ask you what you learned about muhammad ali that you perhaps didn't already know going into ali in uh, 2001 michael man uh everything uh, it, it was spending time, spending time with Muhammad. He was, you know, he was there during uh, all of the pre-production, which went on for eight months, all of the shooting uh, that, that we did in the States because of, of the Parkinson's. He couldn't travel or he'd have been in Africa as well. Uh, recreating that world, the, 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 I mean, everybody's gone. The, the Angela Dundee is gone. Howard Bingham is gone. But you know, Howard Bingham, Angela Dundee, and Muhammad Ali, they you were know, working with them. We were able to build a world and, and uh, the role that Angela Dundee had, along with a couple of other terrific trainers and training Will, Will, uh, you know, becoming a boxer after eight or nine months of uh, five days a week training in the gym we built. But but the, the, uh, the parts of Ali that I did know um, even before I met him, had to do with the fact that I'm one year younger than he was. Mm -hmm. And and what infuriated him in 1967 infuriated me and many other young men and women of my generation. So living through the 60s in particular, which is where we focus a lot, that's, that's something we had in common. I'm not black i'm not african-american you know i know the south side of chicago uh you know to to um uh, to understand why he had a problem with his father painting white jesus for a black church i get it and that's the kind of understanding is difficult to get to but but it's but that's it's it, that's the that's the necessary 
voyage to try to put myself to try to put myself in Muhammad Ali's shoes and and see through uh, see through his eyes as much as I'm capable. But there were a lot of surprises along the way. He was very aware of uh, third world National Liberation Front struggles. Uh, it had to do with who the editor of the Nation of Islam was in the '60s, who happened to be very political and knew what knew and, and wrote about those struggles. So it'd be so and so's haberdashery opened up on 64th Street on the front page, three pages in. It's about the struggle of, of for in, uh, struggles in Angola and Mozambique. Um, so the world that he was alive to and the bringing himself to who shall I, uh, I, I was the heavyweight champion of the world, I'm representative, and how shall I be representative to my people, in effect? Uh, you know, and, and, then, and, then that, and then the expansion of that into everybody rising up from below, that journey of a, for a quest for identity um, or rep the representation, um, you know, that's, um, to me, that's what the, that's what the movie was about. And, uh, <clears throat> spent a lot of time talking to him about that. There was a beautiful movie. It was remarkable. And I'm just wondering, you, you've worked with so many all time greats, Michael, and you've been there and you've done that, but what was it like for you to have Muhammad Ali walk into a room or you walk into his for the first time with your his world his story and your care and your hands and talk to him about that where what was your feeling walking into that room and having it was it was, it was it was it was awesome i mean it was it was extraordinary and and uh i wouldn't have been able to do it without howard bingham mm. and he was uh, ali was one of my all-time heroes sure. from early 60s along with to other guys that I want to uh, work with the American Indian movement. Uh, um, and no, it was, it was hard, hard to describe. It was quite extraordinary. And then Ali spoke very softly. Howard had a little bit of a stutter and I had some difficulty hearing what Ali was saying. So the three of us together <laughs> had some of the same conversations. <laughs> but we met, I think the first meeting I had with him, he was in Las Vegas. Yeah. So uh, let's get to uh, a little bit of heat, if you don't mind. Um, and on my program, um, we have a segment called Celebrity True or False, where I've called um, things that have been written about either a person or a, a film. Right. And um, I've got uh, some some heat, celebrity true or false that I'd like to hit. And you tell me what's true and what's not, if you don't mind, Michael Mann. We'll play that game with you right now. Celebrity true or false. You can't handle the truth. First up for you is true or false. Heat was originally something that you created in the late 70s and wound up making originally or attempting to as a television series called L.A. Takedown. Is that true or false? Uh, that's false. Uh, the Heat screenplay pre-existed L.A. Takedown. And I, I, I extracted the L.A. Takedown script from Heat and could have thought about making it a television series, but got into a disagreement about casting the lead. And then and by re, by, I, I owned it, so I was able to retain all the rights. And so uh, what was the casting conundrum back in the day for television? Uh, there was a uh, I was very, very close friend with Brandon Tartikoff, who ran NBC at the time. And there was one actor who I was interested in having play one role. And Brandon and I had a very friendly, amicable disagreement. And I decided, you know what, let's just leave it alone and not do the series. And then so you just kept the script and 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 is it true? I, I retained I retained the I retained the rights. And the okay. but, but the heat script that pre-existed LA Takedown didn't have the current heat ending. And it wasn't until I discovered that ending that I was able to say, oh, this whole thing clicks in and I want to do it as a movie. So how did you discover the heat ending, Michael Mann? Uh, something analogous to hitting yourself on the head with a hammer for a long period of time and that you finally 
you get I get it, you know. It's just I don't uh it, it had to do with that last image and and the fact and and the idea of of counterpoint or 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 like a fugue in music where the uh that uh, that De Niro's character, you know, Macaulay is riding out of existence into death and is fortunate enough to be in contact with the only other person in his universe who understands him as completely. And that also, at one and the same time, is also the man who killed him. And that both are true and both are there at 100%. And, and so that then gave me the idea that I want to be, when I'm with Hannah, I want him to apprehend Macaulay, 100%. When I'm with Macaulay, I want him to evade Hannah, 100%. And then the challenge, can you make all that happen at the same time? And then take audience and move them from each character. And every time you're with that particular character, you are empathetically completely connected to that character, even though in, the, in regards to story or plot, they're totally oppositional. They have oppositional ambitions to each other. What they want in the world of the film is completely in contradiction to other characters who you're also empathetically connected to. So that structure was very exciting, a very exciting challenge uh, for me. And it came from the end image, then reverse engineered back into the rest of the screenplay via rewriting. And so if it's, it's not a challenge enough, you decided to shoot it at LAX at night with planes landing. How did how did you come up with that? And what were the logistical, I guess, uh, trappings that you had to well, run there? One, one additional trapping was there was also the week the Unabomber threatened to blow up LAX. Come on. Now, really. And then, and then to really put total coincidence work the person who obviously had a role in in dealing with the unabomber and discovering his location was lowell bergman from the insider from the insider yeah. oh my gosh that is uh you can't make that up no. so uh did you did, i mean who did you have to run that through to say hey i want to shoot something with planes flying overhead and and i imagine that 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 you didn't have an unlimited time frame in which to shoot that michael man right well we had well a, a fantastic location manager who i still work with who i just had a meeting with about 25 minutes ago janice right. Pauly nice. managed to get us permission to shoot on the approach to the runways and then when the unabomber threatened to blow up lax she worked magic and we were able to still sh allowed to still shoot there Oh my gosh. Yeah. Next one for you in uh I guess heat celebrity true or false Michael Mann. The Pacino De Niro diner scene was raw, done at De Niro's suggestion without any rehearsal before you shot it on set. Is that true or false? Uh, this this false. The we when when we were in pre-production and we were doing rehearsals uh all of us were of a mind that no you don't rehearse this scene this scene particularly artists like al and bob you, you don't the worst thing you could possibly do is rehearse a scene like that feel you nailed it in the rehearsal you'll never get back to that when you're shooting and so you want magic to happen when you're when you're when when you're actually not just filming it, but when you're filming it and you're and 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 you work towards that groove where it's going to happen and take five, six, seven, or eight, something like that. You don't want it to happen on take one because there could be a can a technical flaw or something wrong with the camera. So you know, film is wonderful. What I love about it is that selection you win with one vote. You know, if you have one great take, that's it. That's the gem, and it'll never quite be that way again. So you're looking for. You're looking for it to be so real and magical and immediate and spontaneous. And so you don't ruin it by over rehearsing a scene like that. So we what we did is we discussed about the scene. We didn't actually, you know, uh, run it. And if anybody spoke the lines, it was kind of in a robotic monotone. Nobody was putting anything, anything into it because we all wanted to do it, you know, that one some way at one time. How did you get Pacino and De Niro? to do it to, to do heat Michael. uh i met i met al because jimmy Kahn introduced me to him after we did thief uh i didn't know bob very well art linson did and then and then bob and i met a couple times and you know they had never really worked together 
in the same film at the same time and um really read the script and yes was the answer and you know and and then we put together what became I think a spectacular ensemble cast and everybody it was like an ensemble company Val would show up on days he wasn't working to see what Bob or Al was doing and John Voight was considered as significant and on exactly the same stellar plane as Bob and Al you know and and you know that was that was the feeling around around the making of the film it was quite wonderful and then a uh, future oscar winner and natalie portman is the as the daughter i mean right. when you when you when you take a look back at it now also the cast actually is even better than i guess or or more yeah. accomplished now when you look back at it uh yeah, true. Dennis, 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 Dennis Haysbert, michael t williamson right. I mean, it's you know who's a close friend you know it's uh, a couple more here for you, Michael. Man, true or false? To prepare for the film. By the way, let me, let me, let me, Michael T. Williamson's Don King yes. is brilliant. It's a brilliant turn in Ali. Yes. Yeah, anyway. Oh no, he's terrific. I mean, he was he, he he's as terrific as they come. Uh, to prepare for the film's climactic bank heist scene, De Niro, Kilmer, and Tom Sizemore, you had him case a bank in Century City with the permission of bank security and then made them recount from memory the layout once they left. Is that true or false? That's true. What 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 did that accomplish in your mind? Well, you can't imagine the tension that re any of us would have if you're if you're you're armed. They were they were unloaded weapons, but they had they had the 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 gear that they were wearing in the actual bank robbery, which meant they had a suit over a vest and they had unloaded weapons and they walked and they just just to walk into a bank like that. The tension <laughs> is extraordinary. And they were there to do a job. They were there to say where the security guards were standing, where the cameras were, how they would go in, if they had to get out, where the more than one exit or two or three exits and basically case the bank. And the uh, like I said, we we did this with with the full knowledge of the sure. bank officers, or they weren't, you know. But and there were we, potentially we, patrons we, in this bank that day depositing or removing or just conducting their bank business, and they look up and there's Robert De Niro, Tom Sizemore, and Val Kilmer looking like they're casing a bank, if not getting set to knock it off. You weren't. You wouldn't recognize them because with sunglasses and everything else that they had on and the hat they didn't wouldn't recognize it as De Niro it wouldn't have been tense for anybody in the bank it was very tense if you're Bob or Val or Sizemore did, did they did they get the memory of the the layout proper did they nail yes. it yes yes they're 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 top-notch actors okay and then last one for you um uh, I'm friends with Hank Azaria he told me this story so I guess I know it's true that in the scene where uh, Pacino uh, basically, you know, cajoled him and told him that uh, the jig was up for him and he's not going to start working for for Hannah, that um, Hank had no idea that Pacino was going to talk the way that he did and the line right. that he did, his famous line, and Hank's reaction of the word Jesus was legit, and that's the the scene that you kept in the film. That's yeah. true. That's true. We had a we, we would do things. Uh, I mean, Al is fantastic, and we would. Uh, he would typically his takes that were great takes that we came prints were always like five, six, or seven, five, six, or seven. He'd hit the zone, and that's where all the great takes were five, six, or seven. Right. And then I we do maybe do another one, take eight, and then he said, "Let me do a wild one," and that became a shorthand for Al just basically unplug. And sometimes it would be outrageous and absolutely terrible. And sometimes it would be absolutely brilliant because he wouldn't know what was going to happen. And when we were we were probably 110 days into 120 days shoot by that point. And so everybody was kind of, you know, kind of um, a little bit worn out. It didn't occur to me that this was Hank. This was his Aria's first day on the show. I should explain to him that what we're doing. Can I do it? Well, yeah, sure. Go ahead. So Hank had no idea what was coming. Either did I. Either did Al. But that's what that came in. Really? Was Al saying. didn't know that that line about the great ass. He didn't know that no, was he coming. No, didn't, didn't. Not necessarily. That, that was you know, that was some of that was scripted. But how exactly explosive oh. it was going to become was a big surprise. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, before I let you go, uh, since you're very busy on the set of Ferrari um, with a remarkable cast, um, Adam Driver, P Penelope Cruz, Shailene Woodley, just to name three, are you yourself surprised by the success of Heat 2, Michael? I'm Mann? really gratified. It was a real push to, 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 try to bring these stories into the worlds that it goes into in 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 um uh everywhere from the kind of the kind of the you know the the the, the bottom levels of street life in la uh, to to the Straits of Malacca, Batam, and transnational crime in the beginning of the dark web and its significance. Um, and uh, his romance and the 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 delivery of the of Val's character of Shaharlis into into completion as a human being. De Niro, De Niro's Macaulay and Al's Hannah are total self-contained characters. They are arrived into their identity, and in the in the sequel part of this, so too does Chris Shaharlis, played by Val Kilmer in the original arrive into into a total complete man a co total complete in, individual in his romance with a very very unusual woman uh anna lou who's based on somebody i met in shit adolescent when we were shooting miami vice so, so uh, is, is there i guess i'm mandated to ask i'm sure you get this question a lot is this um you're gonna make a movie out of this at some point what do you think i'd love to yeah okay that's the end <laughs> I mean, that would be great. You talk to Pacino about it. What do you have you talked to Al about I, it already? I, I'm thinking about it, but I, this is the wrong time to be talking about who I'm thinking about. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Uh, all right, got it. Um, and so, um, I, I know um, the most difficult part about writing a book is selling it. So I appreciate you taking the time out of uh, another yeah. film that you're doing in Italy which I can't wait to see, Ferrari. I know you were a part of Ford versus Ferrari as well, so clearly this is something that interests you as well, yeah. Michael. So I'm looking forward to seeing what you got cooking up, and I appreciate you giving me the time here, sir. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks you so bet. much. You bet. Bye That's bye. Michael Mann right here on The Rich Eisen Show. What a great chat, oh, man. man. That was awesome. For Heat fans, that is wow. right straight up your alley, that sir. That's great. And ladies, let's take a break. Um, we'll uh, unpack a little bit of what we just heard. Sham Sharania will join us to talk about what's going on with the heat on the Nets.
Imagine walking into a bank in Century City back in uh, 1994. You're going to, you know, conduct a little bit of bank business and you look up and there is Robert De Niro in shades in a uh, in a vest and a suit and uh, hardware attached to him. I'd know exactly what Robert De Niro looked like. <laughs> yep. Tom Sizemore, too. I don't know. Val, Top Gun was already out. Val, these are three of the most recognizable actors. Could you imagine they had him case a joint to try and get in the mode of what it's like to case a joint and then rob it? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine that? There's a bank. Uh, don't point. Walk inside. Oh, case my the God. Joint. <laughs> and, then, yeah, and you call up a bank. Like, look, we've got Bob De Niro, Tom Sizemore, Val Kilmer. They're going to rob a bank in a movie. We'd like to give them an idea of what it's like to do that and case a joint. How about you let them do this, and you're aware of it. Don't stop them. Don't have anybody call police either. <laughs> Can you imagine that, man? Well, didn't he also say, if I heard it right, he had them going vests yeah, the underneath, whole thing. This, like they like were everything, like everything, like, dressed, like you like saw them deal. in the movie, ready to go. Like, yeah. I'm How surprised that? nobody called the cops. How about that? Let's call up LAX and, <laughs> I mean, and mid '90s, different time. Let's use the yeah, runway. That's true. Good let's set up our entire operation on the runway of LAX at night, and uh, let's go through that. And then the Unabomber threatens the LAX, and that just raises the tension of everything on the set. How about that story? That was crazy. And him saying that he wants to make a movie out of it. He didn't stutter. He just went, "Yeah, I'd like to do it." Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so. Um, who wouldn't want to see Heat 2? Oh, my gosh. And I said, how, he talked to Pacino about it. And he goes, I don't know. He goes, uh, I, now's not the not time to talk about who I'm thinking about for the hmm. role. I have an idea who he's referring to. Interesting. Because think of his career. Right. Think about who he's thinking about and how he's used people in other movies from other times. Like Mike Kelty Williamson was Don King after being one of the cops in Heat. Right. If I had a guess, Will Smith would be a guy that you can't talk about hiring right now. Yeah. Right? It's kind of what I that thought. That you when reimagine he's... the movie and he's the Vincent Hanna character? You just reimagine. You can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want in Heat 2. I mean, I'm all the way in. Don't you think? Just take my money. <laughs> Take my twenty bucks. Right. Like, let's that's go. that's the guy I would think of that he's thinking of that he can't talk about right now. Yeah, but it makes sense. Makes sense. I mean, it's just total. We're just totally yeah, spitballing just here. Yeah, connect a bunch of dots. Sure. That's what I thought of as soon as he said that. And it had already taken up a half an hour of his time. Can you imagine you're shooting a movie <laughs> and like, let me zoom with Rich Eisen. Hey, hold promote on a the second. book. <laughs> so I didn't follow up, but there you have it. Chrome Soft, the Chrome Soft family of golf balls. There is a Chrome Soft that is out there for you that suits your game. I use the Chrome Soft, the regular Chrome Soft is what it is called, because it suits so many different types of games. I'm not the greatest golfer. I'm, I'm, I'm part of that wide range of golfers who want a better feel, more distance, incredible forgiveness. That's what I need. And, and I, I truly can feel the difference hitting this golf ball than another one. Let's just say I only have one Chrome Soft on the tee. I might uh, have one of those tape delay swing and slice one into somebody's backyard. My Bad apologies. News. Bad news. Um, and somebody flips me another golf ball that's not a Chrome Soft, and I'll hit it. You, I can tell the difference, and I'm not an expert at it. If you're a better player, there is the Chrome Soft X that provides excellent spin consistency, tour-level short game control. The Chrome Soft XLS is a lower spin golf ball on longer shots, you can feel a firmer feel, and you get more high spin around the greens if, if you're expert at this. And so there's a, there's a Chrome Soft that's right for you. When you add it all up, it's pretty simple. Chrome Soft is better for the best and better for everyone. Find out which Chrome Soft is right for you at CallawayGolf.com slash Chrome Soft. What a great chat with Michael Mann. I could have gone in so many different directions. Anybody who's a fan of Heat, if you missed it, go to our YouTube stream that you're maybe watching us on YouTube.com slash Rich Eisen Show. We'll post the whole interview there as soon as this show is over. So that was some neat stuff right there. And coming up at top of hour number three, uh, Sham Sharania will join us. One of the top basketball information men in the business. What did the Nets say to Kevin Durant to have him just say, okay, that trade demand, I'm rescinding it. And there's a partnership now. They call it a partnership, which is interesting because normally it's like, you know, you play basketball for us and we will pay you as part of management. But they're talking about partnership. Is that what helped sweeten the pot for him? 
So we'll talk about that with Shams and then uh, Devin McCourty of the Patriots and you, if you want to join us, hour three. So here we are still on our YouTube stream. Just us chickens as our terrestrial radio audience is now listening to some very important commercials. <laughs> Pay them bills. <laughs> I know you, you, you asked something about heat that I didn't ask him, right? That you, 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 you heard something about... You said something the other day I wish I'd, I'd asked him. Oh, in the, uh, in the true or false. Is it about... Uh, that, that Hannah had a drug habit that oh, they yeah, cut so, out of the movie entirely? Yeah, so I had heard the reason why he's so kind of high-strung and unpredictable yeah, is right. that, like, he was supposed to be on, like, cocaine basically the whole movie, and they kind of scrapped that from the... From, from the, the, from the, the film. Ending, yeah. Which kind of explains some of his outbursts. Some of his outbursts? There's a ton of them, obviously. Like the scene with Tone Loke and then the another one great I didn't, ass scene. Like, another know. one I didn't get to um, is apparently the Shaherlis character played by Val Kilmer. They, uh, they asked Keanu Reeves first. Ooh, and wow. he said no because he was playing Caesar in, um, like a, play or in a play. Yeah. Oh, wow. The Chris character also had a huge gambling problem, which is part of why he couldn't walk away. I wish they would have gotten more into that. But I'd also heard uh, they shot every scene on location somewhere in Los Angeles. No sound stage is used for the whole movie. I was thinking that, too. Like, what are some of the greatest Los Angeles-based movies? Heat has got to oh, be one man, of them. It's way up there, yeah. Right. LA Confidential. Sunset Boulevard. I know you don't watch anything on in black and white, Chris. <laughs> Die Hard, obviously. Die Hard. Is absolutely. Uh, a recent that wasn't one. shot at the North Pole? I'm sorry. I'm confused. What else? It literally takes place on Christmas Eve. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, the recent movie, McConaughey, Lincoln Lawyer. It's a great L.A. movie. Naked Gun? Naked, naked Gun. How about Friday? L.A. movie. Friday's Friday. a great one. Mm, okay. That's terrific. Yeah. Any other good L.A. movies that we're forgetting? Well, Friday, too. I mean, Friday well, I mean, after next, the, whole the next thing. Friday. <laughs> where, where LA is right. kind of is kind of a star of the movie uh, as well, yeah, you know. Yeah. What down and out in LA, right? What eight days in the valley? Is that another one? Two days in the two valley. Two days in the valley? Yeah. I forget how many days there are. Two. two Charlie Theron makes it feel like it's a month though. It's La La Land. La La Land is a great one. Chinatown. That won the Oscar for like five seconds. Five, t- I think it was more like fifteen <laughs> seconds, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're going to take a couple-minute like, break. Pulp Fiction. Like, How can we forget that one? It just popped in my head. Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. That's right. Yeah. Pulp Zed's Fiction. dead, baby. Movie. All right, we'll yeah. take Somebody's privileges were revoked, yeah. right? Not any of uh, We'll so. take a break right here on the Rich Eisen Show. When we come back, Shams Charania will tell us what happened with the Nets. The senior NBA insider from the Athletic and Stadium will join us in just a couple minutes' time. Stick with us, please. The Rich Eisen Show. Put it all together. Live from the Rich Eisen Show studio in Los Angeles. Kyrie Irving. 
decides, you know what? I don't think I'm going to get that money elsewhere. I'll, 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 I'll just go back. Durant says, you know what? I'm out. Oh, you know what? I'll, I'll just go back. Earlier on the show, Falcons head coach Arthur Smith, 15-time hot dog eating contest champion Joey Chestnut, four-time Oscar nominee, author and director Michael Mann. Coming up, Patriot safety Devin McCourty, senior NBA insider for The Athletic, Sham Sharania. And now, it's Rich Eisen. Yes, it is. Can confirm, sources say. And here I am on YouTube.com slash Rich Eisen Show and Odyssey and this Rich Eisen Show terrestrial radio affiliate that is carrying this show. And we greatly appreciate it coast to coast. We say hello to our podcast listeners. And we are just, again, reminding everyone that this show will start airing on the Roku channel for free on Roku devices, on Fire TV, on Samsung Smart TVs, on mobile devices, and also the Roku channel.com. The Roku channel is free, and we are starting streaming there this very September, still from 12 to 3 Eastern, still the same top-notch caliber information and entertainment that we provide every single day, like Joey Chestnut, the champion <laughs> uh, hot dog eater, saying he will, in fact, use a hot dog as a straw to drink a beer tonight at Wrigley Field. <laughs> that happened one hour ago on the show at this very time. So on behalf of everyone on planet Earth, you're welcome. Um, that'll be happening. Um, Devin McCourty of the Patriots will join us. We just hung up with the director, Michael Mann, whose book, He Too, is number one on the novel bestseller list for the New York Times. And he told some great stories from the set of Heat. If you missed any of that, YouTube.com slash Rich Eisen Show is your source for all of that. Our first story that we talked about yesterday was the news that uh, we learned because we follow Sham Sharania, the uh, athletic and uh, stadium NBA insider on Twitter. He mentioned that the Nets had all gotten together, the owner of the Nets and his wife and Kevin Durant and Rich Kleiman and Sean Marks and Steve Nash, the last two being the general manager and the coach that supposedly Kevin Durant refused to play for or have still on the team if he was going to rescind his trade demand and stay. And they're still there, and so is Durant. So on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line to explain this all is none other than Sham Sharani. How are you, sir? Rich, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. So what happened, man? How how did this genie get put back in the bottle? I, I think a lot of it, Rich, was just the realization from Kevin Durant and the Nets, really, that there was not going to be a trade at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, that was going to happen. And so at that point, Kevin Durant was going to be faced with a decision coming up because training camp is just a month away and if there's no deal Kevin Durant's going to be faced with the decision do I show up in a disgruntled state of mind kind of pull a Jimmy Butler James Harden that we've seen over the last two three years or is it going to be one of those things where you have a holdout situation you know the likes of Ben Simmons just a year ago and I don't think Kevin Kevin this saga has already gotten ugly as, as it is I mean it's already gotten personal in terms of the trade request itself was personal and then the ultimatum that was given to Joe Sy a few weeks ago was personal. And just going down that path, clearly it just wasn't going to be something that either side wanted to stomach. And so it was really just a realization and the eye-opening experience that a deal wasn't going to happen. The best offer I'm told that the Nets had on the table was from the Celtics, Jalen Brown, Derek White, and a first-round pick. And the, the price tag that the Nets had put forth on Kevin Durant and – you know, you, you could say that they might have been even asking for something that they know was never going to be attainable anyway, right? But at the end of the day, when you have a guy that's a 12-time All-Star, two-time Finals MVP, going to go down in the Hall of Fame, one of the top 15, you know, 12, 20 best players ever, you, you have a high asking price. And that price was never going to be met. And I think both sides understood that this is the best opportunity to win a championship. And, Rich, I thought once the season ended – once the Nets were swept on April 23rd, that's when this meeting should have taken place because mm -hmm. there were a lot of you know grievances, there were a lot of feelings on both ends that needed to be aired out, and you know better late than never. Uh, you know, but this should have been done months ago. It finally happens now, and um, I, I think they they both sides came to the realization that we need each other, and and, and at this point. It's, there's going to be pressure when you go into this next season, but they needed to move past this because the deal just was not going to happen. So uh, the other date in question, Shams, is June 30th. That's the date that 
uh, the trade demand by Durant became public, and it was just a couple of days after Kyrie opted back in, and so many people started drawing a, a connected line between those two dots. And then we learn that uh, he that Durant wants the general manager and coach out as a condition of his staying and rescinding his trade demand. So you used the word disgruntled moments ago. What exactly was Durant, or is he still disgruntled about? I, I think just when you look at how this summer has played out, they were swept in in the in the uh, um, you know in the playoffs in the, in round one. That series did not end. That season did not end how everyone expected. And I, I think a level of accountability we saw, you know, Sean Marks, the press conference that he had in mid-May, and, and a lot of the, the tone of the press conference was about accountability, about, um, you know, resetting the culture, about how the culture might have, you know, worsened or, or might not be what it was a few years ago. Well, the only thing that really changed in the last few years was the arrival of Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. So, I, I don't know how those two guys took it, but that, you know, was something that did occur. Um, and then I, I think you have to look at the Kyrie Irving, uh, you know, extension negotiations. And the fact that both sides were not able to get a deal done, Kevin Durant has, um, you know, vocally supported, privately supported Kyrie Irving over the last six to eight months, while I think a, a lot of, of people have come down on Kyrie Irving. And so I, I think you cobble those two things, you know, in this situation, Adam Harrington, uh, an assistant on the Nets staff who was very close with Kevin Durant, a guy that's known throughout the league as, as a Durant confidant. Um, he was fired at the end of the season. Um, and so you, you take all those things to account and just a lack of communication that existed between both sides. And again, that's something on both sides, right? That's something on, on the player side. That's something on the team side, because at the end of the day, the only way you're going to get resolutions, the only way you're going to get past, moments in life that are tough is through conversation and through a real relationship and through an open forum. And, and it took these guys, Rich, two months uh, to get in, a, in the same room in a meeting together. Well, actually, actually more than that. It May, June, July, August, four months to get in the same room um, and two months since the trade request. So that tells you everything you need to know about where this gulf existed. Sham Sharania here on the Rich Eisen Show, the Athletic and Stadium Senior NBA Insider. Look, I mean, I'm sure you've been involved in negotiations in your career, doing what you do. I have as well. Uh, anytime you agree to something based on the fact that management doesn't give you what you want and presents the reality as a fait accompli, um, it doesn't really uh, sit, sit in well with the person who accepts the fait accompli, and that's Durant. The fait accompli is that we're, we're we're not getting the value that we place on you. You should take that as a compliment, although that prevents you from getting the exit visa you want. And you don't want to hold out. We don't want you to hold out. So let's just, you know, let's just go back together again and let bygones be bygones. Is that really the way it's going to be? Is that the way they're entering the season with this still bubbling beneath the surface? Or was this conversation in Los Angeles airing things out and they really have come to an agreement, and it's all hunky dory. What do you got for me? Rich, I, I I I think it's a little bit of both, and it, and it's it, that's why these things are complex. It's not just a black and white situation. Right. I think this is very very complex. It could be both things. Now, in a perfect world, you know, in a perfect life, I think Kevin Durant clearly would have loved to get traded, and I think the Nets, in a perfect world, um, you know, they they wouldn't have had the restrictions of the rookie designated extension rule that didn't allow them to get a guy like Bam Adebayo or Donovan Mitchell on the roster because they had Ben Simmons on the team. And in a perfect world, the Nets would have gotten teams gutting their roster and giving every last asset like Joe Sy and, and Sean Marks had wanted in any type of Kevin Durant trade. Um, so that's in a perfect world. But we, as, as we know, Rich, <laughs> the world and life just isn't perfect, especially for a guy like Kevin Durant. He's got four years left on his deal. So trade like this, if, if this was going to go down – during training camp, before training camp, during the season, it was going to get uglier than what it already was. And that might be tough for the listeners to believe and tough for people to believe, but that's just business. And in the NBA, if, if a guy wants to trade, it's going to get ugly. If a guy on a four-year deal wants to trade, we saw what happened with Ben Simmons. We saw the saga that took place. And I think both sides at the end of the day, Kevin Durant, you know, 33, going on 34, the legacy at the end of the day that he's built, the, the stature that he's built in this league, um, he's going to go down as a top 10 to 20 player of all time. 
do you want to put yourself in a position where you're holding out of games? And clearly he did not want to go down that route. And clearly the Nets didn't want him to go down that route. Right. So, I, and, and on the same token, I do think this opportunity, from everything I've been told, they left that meeting energized and ready for next season. I don't think this meeting was Kevin Durant left and he's like, man, I still want to get traded. Like, what the hell? I, I, I don't think that's the tenor. I know that's not how the tenor of the, that conversation ended. Best you can tell her, he and Kyrie cool? Like, because again, he, he, Kyrie returns. And and Durant is he he and Rich Kleiman are very astute. He had to know like I'm going to ask for a trade, and I know that they're you know they, they the, in this day and age those people like Durant are accommodated because they're Durant. But they had to know that they could end like this as well. So why would he opt out after Kyrie opts in? Why would that happen? Yeah, I, I think I think you know a couple of things. One, I think yeah, I mean Kyrie uh, Irving and Kevin Durant, um, they they've continued their relationship. You know, the one guy since the NBA season, since the Nets season ended mm-hmm. on April twenty third, the one guy with the Nets that Kevin Durant had remained in communication with from everything I've been told was Kyrie Irving. That was the one guy that he was communicating with on a regular basis. There, you know, but their friendship, that relationship goes beyond just basketball. I think it's more of a life. Uh, friendship that that those two have and I think there was a decision made uh you know throughout this the last four four and a half months that listen Kyrie Irving had a player option at the end of the day he had to do what's best for him Kevin Durant was entering the first year of a four-year extension he had to do what's best for him I don't think either of those situations had you know I think those were pretty spelled out like Mm -hmm. we're gonna do what's best for ourselves and each other um, you know, versus like, let's figure out like how we can, cause they've already teamed together once in 2019. That's how they got to the Nets. I think now this is a different situation. Um, and as far as Kyrie Irving, the moment he opted in, I think his mindset just was, how can I make the most of being on the Nets with or without Kevin Durant? I think his mindset was focused on being a net. And I think over the last several weeks, you know, ever since summer league and, and the opt in, I think the Nets and Kyrie Irving from everything I've been told have had positive constructive dialogue and I think that being a a backdrop of all of this I think you know at least the Nets have had the stability of Kyrie Irving being comfortable being back in in any circumstance um so I I don't think that Lakers scenario was was really ever on the table um in a real way once Kyrie Irving opted in. Sean Sharani here on the Rich Eisen show so where does Simmons fit in all of this is it true um that Simmons left a text chain that involved a Nets player a group of Nets players during the playoffs they asked him to come back for game four and he left the chat room that's a a hot story and rumor is that true did that happen best you can tell that that uh that that did not happen rich uh 100 did not happen um as far as Ben Simmons's future and how he plays in all this I think he plays a very big role in all this I mean at the end of the day he is part of this big three he is there's going to be a lot of hope and a lot of expectations on Ben Simmons this season. He did not play last season. Um, there, there was hope. There was expectation he was going to play in game four in that first round series. He did not play. And so there's a lot for him to prove next season. And from everything I've been told, he has looked apart this summer. He had back surgery in May to uh, fix an issue that's gone on for the last few, few years. And he's made a great recovery from what, I'm, from what I'm told. And he's already been cleared for full three on three. In the coming weeks, he's going to be cleared for full five-on-five. Five. And the expectation, and he's on track to be fully cleared for the start of training camp in, in late September. And so he fits a very big picture in all this. I, you know, when, when the Nets made that trade last year, traded away James Harden, Ben Simmons was thought of to be a perfect fit on that team. He's able to defend. He's able to pass. He's able to rebound, ball handled. He's able to do everything that alleviates the pressure from Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. And, and only time will tell. You know, we can all – you know, I can speak on the information that I have, but at the end of the day, the only thing that will dictate how Ben Simmons, you know, the trajectory of his career is going to be when he steps foot on the uh, on the floor, and that's going to be coming up here in three seasons. So just two more questions for you on this, Shams. So couldn't help but notice in the press statement or the the release that came out to confirm from the team what you were reporting that everyone met in Los Angeles and that they're going to continue on and the word partnership was used, and also couldn't help but notice that Durant and Kleiman's 
brand, the boardroom, had its logo next to the Nets logo, and the word partnership was used. Is am I? Can we connect these dots again and see that the may, maybe part of this conversation was the the Nets were gonna, I don't know, do something with Durant's company or or production company in conjunction? Why, why use the word partnership and why put his logo on this? Team yeah, I, I, I don't know about the logo aspect. As far as the partnership, I think that that verbiage is, is, is important because I, I do think the last three years, the relationship between Kevin Durant, Joe Sy, Sean Marks, that has been a partnership, right? Like if you're making moves for your organization, you know, as Sean Marks and Joe Sy have been over the last three years, ever since they got Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, you want to involve your star players. You know, different organizations do that. When we look at the Lakers, the Clippers, um, you know, the Nets, uh, te- teams like that. Um, I-, I think that just comes with his stature, and I think it has been a partnership. Now, when did that partnership kind of start to crumble a little bit? Clearly, the last uh, three, four months is, is when that partnership crumbled, you know, when the trade request was made and the ultimatum was made. But now the fact that that verbiage was used again, that I, I think, again, re- reemphasizes that – I. I, I do from everything I, I, I'm, I'm told what I believe is that those sides left that meeting with, with the, you know, renewed energy, a renewed hope of like, let's finish what we started and let's see how next season goes. And I, I do think that was genuine. And okay. And that all that said, um, the general sense that I've uh, feel and sense, and I think others will is in the crucible of a playing season, losing streaks will happen or a timeout will occur that Durant might not agree with or Kyrie might not agree with. There's always disagreements, um, but usually teams can overcome that unless there was something beneath the surface uh, a year prior that required an offseason like this and a meeting like the one that happened in Los Angeles to kind of put back in the bottle. Is this uh, – how fragile will this be? Because I think everyone will look at Brooklyn Nets games this year to see body language, to see – press conferences, how they're conducted, that um, that trade deadlines might might force action as well. What do you think about that, Shams? I, 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 I do believe there's going to be a lot of pressure on the Nets this season. There's going to be a lot of pressure on the players from Kevin Durant um, after the situation, on Kyrie Irving entering the last year of his deal, Ben Simmons from last season, what happened there, Joe Harris coming back from injury, uh, pressure on Sean Marks, on Steve Nash, on the entire organization, I think from top to bottom, I think that meeting was important because everyone has to be better. So there's no doubt, you know, what, whatever, you know, word you want to use, whether it's, you know, th- there's going to be a very thin line to this season, no question. When that adversity hits, when you lose games, you know, how will those star players, those stakeholders take it? That's going to be very important. But those habits are going to be built in training camp. And we're going to know, you know, as training camp goes and as that's going along, what the tenor of, of those relationships within those fine lines is going to be. But there's no question. There's going to be pressure on this entire organization. Uh, really, the moment media day tips off on September 26th. Okay, and last one for you, Omnibus. What's the latest steps for the Lakers? Russell Westbrook, his future, What now that uh, LeBron has signed an extension. What do you think? Um, you know, I, I would expect the Lakers to continue to look at the marketplace to make their team better. And, you know, I, I don't think there's a concerted effort to moving Russell Westbrook. I think the concerted effort is, can we make a, a deal with certain players on the roster with picks that we have to improve this team? And if there's not going to be a deal out there, then I, I think this team is pretty comfortable standing pat um, and running it back with Darvin Ham, you know, n- newly at the helm. But I, I think, you know, I would keep a close eye on guys like Patrick Beverly, Boyan Bogdanovich. Um, you know, those are the guys that are still on the marketplace right now that could be available. I, could, I didn't know Beverly was available uh, I, I, until, you know, um, he blamed it all on Durant that he's still available. I saw that today. That was great. Did you see that one, Shams? Did you see that one? <laughs> I, I, I did. I, I think Utah has, you know, a, a bevy of guys. You know, we look at Donovan Mitchell, those talks with the Knicks are continuing. Other teams around the league are talking to the Jazz about – about Donovan Mitchell, um, but I think those the the best aside from Mitchell. When you look at Beverly Bogdanovich, 
Mike Conley, Jordan Clarkson, I, 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 Malik Beasley, I think all those guys, you know, at, at a certain price tag are, are available. Shams, thanks for the call. Really appreciate it. Uh, I always love picking your brain. Thanks for the time. Look for more of my calls, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rich. Have a good one. The one and only Shams Sharani. I follow him on Twitter. You should as well. Let's take a break. We'll come back. And Devin McCourty of the New England Patriots has just called in. We'll take his call in just a few moments. Back here on the Rich Eisen Show, 844-204-RICH is the number to dial. Our terrestrial radio audience will rejoin us in just a couple of minutes' time. Um, boy, we just have, I got a got a whole bunch there from Sham Sharania about the Nets and the conversation there, and we'll, we'll unpack that after the next conversation we're about to get to on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line from the New England Patriots. They're practicing in Vegas, right? So they they are, man. Okay, nice little McDaniels reunion. Uh, now that he's uh, coaching the Las Vegas Raiders, uh, joining us here, uh, a longtime veteran in this league and, of course, of the New England Patriots, Devin McCourty back here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you doing, Devin? I'm good. How are you doing, Rich? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm going to jump right into it right here. Who gets the Cirque du Soleil tickets, you or Belichick? Who gets that for you guys? Uh, de- definitely not me. <laughs> So Bill's on it? Bill's on it for you guys, the Bill? Blue Man Group? He's all on it for you? I, def- I definitely see him doing that for us. Don't you that think? sounds like a good day for us all. Don't you think? Yeah, you should ask him. Have we seen the Blue Man Group tonight, Bill? Is that what we're going to do? I mean, we're, we're in Vegas. Why not? Why not? Oh, although everything that happens there stays there. So I appreciate you trying to keep that under, <laughs> keep that under wraps. Um, so walk me through what's going on in your world and how, uh, and how different things might be uh, in this training camp based on other previous ones in the, the ever-changing world of the New England Patriots, Devin? Anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I think at, at the end of the day, man, it's, it's back and forth. It's going back and forth. I mean, obviously, last week practicing against Carolina was different. Um, and I think just being out here in Vegas, we obviously opened uh, week one in Miami, so that heat and the weather. So being out here the last three days, you know, we practiced by ourselves uh, on Monday. So being out here and then practicing against uh, this quality team, I think, has been a lot of good work for us. Uh, some back and forth. They're a talented group. So uh, I know just speaking from a defensive side, we got a lot of good work. Uh, seeing against, you know, seeing against guys like Devontae Adams, guys we don't see all the time, and Rent Rope and those different guys, I think we got uh, some really good looks out here. So, yeah, and Waller as well. I'm sure he presents a challenge in a practice, in a scrimmage, he, that's for yeah, sure. He, 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 has, he hasn't been out here this week, so we haven't gotten to see him. Okay. He's probably, yeah, he's, they're ready to unpack him at some point, I imagine. So, okay. Um, so, uh, what's going on uh, in the world of the offense on that side of the ball, Devin? There's so much concern about the way the offense is being run and who's coordinating and who's calling the plays. What insight can you give us on how the offense looks right now for New England, uh, it's, Devin? It's a work in progress, man. I think a lot of those guys have been talking about that and. And speaking about it, and I think that's what it is, man. I know for me, uh, my, it's my 13th year. I've never worried about the offense. I just, I've always felt like my concern needs to be what I do, and, and for this team, that's playing defense and being a leader on the defensive side. And I think everything comes along when it comes along. I've been in camps before where offensively it felt like we were behind, and then the season hit, and you can see the game plan and then everything get rolling. So uh, I know there's a lot of questions from the outside. Um, I think, but, you know, inside us as a team, guys have just been kind of trucking along, figuring things out. And, you know, there's some real good moments out here on the practice field. And it's fun in these joint practices getting a chance to just cheer the offense on, having fun. And, you know, I think we got to do a little bit of that the last two days. Weird seeing Patricia uh, huddle up with the offense to you? Is it weird seeing him doing that? Uh, I would say at first, but I think coming off of last year, he did so many different things. He helped out with the offense. He helped out with the defense. 
So he was just all over the place. And I think now he's still, you know, figuring out and doing multiple roles for the team. And uh, right now that's been more offense. And, you know, I think it's been good for us. So he's doing more than just calling the plays is what you're saying? I have, Rich, I'll tell you the truth. I have no idea what they do on offense. I love it. Okay. I appreciate that honesty right there. Devin McCourty here on the Rich Eisen Show. He's just mentioned year 13 for 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 this terrific professional football player. And we're back here on the Rich Eisen Show terrestrial radio outfit talking with Devin McCourty calling in from Las Vegas, Nevada, where the Patriots are, are going through a scrimmage right now. How is different? I know you just mentioned how, you know, you don't really know what's going on on the offensive side of the ball because you're 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 focused on your side. Do you notice a difference, though, in Mac Jones at all, the way he carries himself, the way that he's walking around the team, the way that he huddles up, anything like that? Do you notice a difference? Oh, no, no doubt about it. I think he's just been way more of himself this year, I think. You know, when you come into anything and you're a rookie, I think everything's on, you know, how do I learn? I need to learn to do this. I need to learn everything possible. And I feel like this year he's kind of let some of that go. He's obviously still learning, but he's being himself. He's leading. He's doing the things that I think he did at Alabama that he did in high school. Um, and that's the things I've been encouraging him. Like, don't try to be uh, a type of leader that you think you should be. Just be yourself. And it's been a lot of fun, obviously, as an older guy, to watch him grow in just a year and do different things. Um, it's helped us out a lot offensively, and I would say overall, even as a team. Yeah, he just seems to be more in command or at least more comfortable, obviously, being a rookie in the league. It couldn't be helpful as well as he's trying to find his way in his place that Brady returned, right? I mean, that that had to be something different for him to deal with. And then, you know, the way that the season did uh, end, as despite the, the terrific stretch in the middle, uh, it was a learning curve. And I'm just wondering if you think he comes in more confident this year. Yeah, I mean, this, this is probably one of the hardest places to be at. You're playing for a franchise – has won, you know, multiple Super Bowls. You come behind Tom Brady. It's just I think everything was stacked up there. And I think last year he came in and did a great job of just going to work. You know, he spent so much time in the facility uh, working with different guys, figuring things out. Um, and I think that was a good foundation for him. And I think this year it's like, all right, I've done that. Now let me try to advance and move to the next level and ignore all the other things and just try to be the best version uh, of myself. And I think the group that we have, player-wise on offense, encouraging them, upbeat guys. They love to have fun. Um, I think that's made it a lot easier for him to come out and just kind of sling it and have fun and play football. And then the defensive side of the ball, the do-your-job aspect of uh, of that, um, how is it coming together? Obviously, J.C. Jackson's not with the team anymore. Your, your uh, two cents on how things are looking on that side of the ball that clearly you're part of, Devin. Yeah, I think we, we've had some really good moments, I think, uh, we have a, a lot of good players up front. I think that's probably the strength right now. Uh, when I look at guys like Barmar and Judon and Gotchow and Bentley, those guys have been so aggressive. We saw here over the last two days um, getting after the passer and making plays. And I think in the secondary, um, we have a lot of familiarity right now, you know, with guys doing most of the things like Jonathan Jones and Miles Bryan and then our safety group returning. Uh, the three guys that played a lot last year, myself, AP, and Doug, um, we've just been putting it together. I think we've kind of challenged ourselves to kind of take it up a notch each time we step on the field. And um, I think that's been the battle. And, you know, obviously, like I said, we've had some really good moments. Um, and we'll figure things out as we get into game plan and then doing more things like that as the season comes. Um, but I'm excited with some of the things we can do as a defense and grow from there. Um, but I think having some of the older guys, the guys that have played, uh, and this defense for a while will help us, especially early in the season. We had the former head of NFL refs, Mike Pereira, who now works as a rules analyst on Fox, talking to us the other day, Devin McCourty, about the, the league's emphasis on the illegal contact rule and how there were so few penalties in that regard last year. The competition committee has instructed the officials to put more of an emphasis on it to see those numbers go up. Have you noticed that? And if so, what has Belichick already counseled you guys knowing that is coming? Well, we always talk about do business as business being done. So you got to kind of gauge how to call it. But I hate it. I hate why, why do we need more illegal contact? You know, it's, we, we, can, we can barely touch the receivers and stuff already. So to think that they're going to, you know, that they're going out there and calling more. We met with the refs and they told us the same thing of how they're going to be trying to see that more and call it more. So, uh, another challenge for defensive players and 
particularly in the secondary, of how we can get the offense to score more points. So when the officials came to camp and told you that, did you push back? I mean, you're a 13-year vet. I I didn't. I, I've learned. I've had, again, now 13 times when we met with officials, and it's usually a back and forth. And each Sunday, I would say it's a little different. And you got to figure it out through that first quarter. How's the game being called? Not just for you, paying attention a little bit when our offense is on the field. How are they calling it? What calls are they calling? Is DPI going to be called close? Holding? Legal contact? Like all that stuff you watch, and then you kind of go as the game's being called. And I would say the good referees in this league, you know, they call it consistent. However it goes, they kind of call it like that. And I think you got to gauge off that and play from there. I mean, you're a safety. you you got guys much bigger than you sometimes coming at you off the line. You know, I mean – and, and sometimes you got to grab, you got to grab and tug a little bit. You got to get good at it. That's what I'll say. That's what Darrell Reeves taught me. He's huh. like, it's not that you don't hold. You got to get good at holding. <laughs> what a line. It's not that you don't hold. You got to get good at holding. That's what he said to you, huh? Wow. That's what, that's what it's about. You got to, you got to learn the tricks of the trade. Hmm. Devin McCourty here on the Rich Eisen Show. So, Devin, I don't want to start anything, but I'll do it. I know. How about that as a, as a wind-up for my pitch here? Um, I, oh, man. No, no, no. Your brother is now part of the paparazzi, <laughs> part of my world at the NFL Network now <laughs> on Good Morning Football. And I noticed uh, he tapped out of your Twitter account and created his own. Um, you cool with that, Devin? Yeah, I, I told him. Like, I, Rich, I would finish practice, and I would go check Twitter. And there would be like 20 mentions about uh, about his show. And I'm just like, I haven't watched any of Good Morning Football. I don't know what he said. Yeah. And people are blowing us up about some take he had on this team's not going to be a contender. I was like, bro, you got to get your own Twitter. Like, I, I can't deal with this every day. And I'm still getting tweets about what he says. And I just try to direct the people to his own personal account. Because I'm sure he's saying a lot of nonsense on there every morning. <laughs> Let's say. Yeah, so, again, I don't want to start anything, but you kind of open the door there. So you're He's saying, saying oh, Jason's oh, bad oh, takes oh, are clogging oh, up your Twitter timeline. Yeah. Is, is that what you're saying, <laughs> Devin? His bad yeah. takes are clogging up your Twitter timeline, your mentions? You don't need no, that? No doubt about it. But I did tell him, man, be aggressive with your take. And uh, whatever you feel, say it. Don't try to play the fit. Okay. And uh, let's just say on your bye week, uh, Jason wants a week off. Will you sneak in there and uh, purport to be him and try and trick everybody and spend a week and get off your chest what Belichick won't let you get off your chest and let your brother own it? Can you do that, Devin? I'm, what do you I'm, think? I'm, I'm, all, I'm all for that, Rich, but we got to kind of keep that low. Huh. I, I can't get fired, you know, at mm. the bye week. That won't go well for me. You're just My there. wife will be angry if I'm stuck at home. I stood. Understood. I got it. I, I guess I should have asked you that offline instead of putting that out <laughs> in front of the people just like that. But y- your brother's doing a great job, though. He sure is. He's a natural at it. Appreciate that. He's a natural I'll at it. I'll tell him. He is. No, I told him, too, when he came on, and we'll have him on again. And I just think that's not, a, that's, that's not an easy uh, gig. That show is, you know, yeah. freewheeling. There's not a lot of prompter. You got to say stuff off the top of your head. You got to react, and he's—I think he's doing a really great job so far. Really do. Yeah, he likes to talk. Ah, uh-huh. okay, very good. <laughs> All right, is is and last one for you, Devin. Uh, we've noticed in our uh, review of Bill Belichick's press conferences that he's been smiling a little bit more and uh, throwing out compliments more than usual. Has he mellowed? Do you think? He, he's a happy guy, man. Uh, I don't know. That's. I think you could probably get that out of him. I don't know <laughs> how many people can, but Rick, I think you would be able to figure out what, what's got him so happy. I don't know. Life? I don't know. Just Maybe, like, man. And football. And grandchildren, man. Grandchildren do that. That's right. Because you can hand them off once you're done with them. Once you're done with them, you, go, you give them back to the parent. Grandparents, that's yeah, the best exactly. part about it. Oh, man. <laughs> Devin, thanks for the time. Greatly appreciate the time uh, calling in from Vegas. And um, let's let's chat during the season. Always appreciate our Definitely, conversations. Man. Good okay. talking to you, Rich. Take care. That's Devin McCourty right here on the Rich Eisen Show. Don't worry about the offense, Chris. That's what he's, That's the message. Is he off the phone yet? Uh, he is. With all due respect, Devin. I'm very worried. I'm very worried. See the reports that they had their worst offensive practice of Rich, the summer? I'm reading all the tweets. I can't get enough. It's just like, you know what I mean? I'm not happy unless I'm unhappy. Well, I'm very unhappy, which means I'm happy. But I'm reading all the tweets. And it's driving me insane. How much? What, how many more days until the season starts? Well, uh, September 11th is when the Patriots visit Miami. Today is the 24th, is it? Yes, I yep. think we're like 14. There's still time to get two rid weeks. of these. There's still time to get two rid of these weeks. There's still time to get rid of these Two plus weeks. There you go.
and get someone who knows what they're doing. That, that won't happen. <laughs> and Mac, you trust, bro. Here we yeah, go. Mac, I trust. Uh, not, not in Patricia, I trust, and Judge, I trust. Oh, man. What a, can no we put the Patriots there. schedule up? Let's put the Patriots schedule up, please. There it is. Two did on the I, road to start. Did I do this already? I Two like on the road. You have already. not. You want to do it? Yeah, you did. You picked them to win like 12 games. Oh, I don't I have it like, written down. No, no, a ten on and, a I think I did 10 and 7. Wait a minute. I feel like oh. I did this already. Uh, hold on a minute. Let me get. I, I, you win 1,000%. Let me write this down. But I feel no, like I did he has not done it. I would have. I write these down. On my book. And we really? have not done it. He has not done it. Maybe he did it with you guys. Uh, Maybe he did it. Maybe did, did, you you do it hit, did you do it while I was you buying hair, my maybe? rakish hat? <laughs> you, didn't do it. you didn't do it in July. You can't do it in July. No, well, no you no, made no, me no, do no, the no, Cowboys no. in July. So um, I couldn't have done it. Well, it's because you were talking, I, some, talking some game. I, mean, I, rarely, I barely you said it. You had him 11 and 6. You had him eleven and six, and I had the the uh, Eagles at twelve and five. Oh right. Uh, and a fan of the show, I didn't write who, whose name down. Had the Giants go nine and eight. All right. Well, let's do it. Can you give me, please? Yes, sir. NFL Films music. Oh baby. Chris Brockman. After just hearing from Devin McCourty, you say, "Don't worry, the offense will be okay." Mac Jones is much more confident. He believes in him. Everybody, chill out. Patricia's always done more than just defense. He's done offense before. Uh, And so after hearing all that from Devin McCourty, Chris Brockman still is all wound up about how bad the offense reportedly looks. They had a good day today, apparently. Perfect Um, timing then, Chris. Let's go! (laughs) I need the music. Patriots' schedule is up. Chris Brockman, week one at Miami. Loss. Week two, the the first team to visit Acrisure Stadium. Bounce back, win. Win. Uh, home for the Ravens. Loss. At the Green Bay Packers. Loss. Oh, you'll be losing your mind if they start one and three. It's going to happen. Uh, the Detroit Lions at right. home. By the way, here comes the bounce back stretch. Win. At the Browns. Win. Home for the Bears Monday night. Win. At the Jets. Win. Home for the Colts. Mm. Colts are good. Good defense. Loss. They're five and four going into the bye week. We'll take it. All right. That's, that's a win. Home for the Jets. Win. At the Vikings on Thanksgiving night on NBC. I think the Vikings are going to be pretty good this year. Loss. I told you Kevin O'Connell is going to unlock Kirk Cousins' inner prime time ability. They're going to score a lot of points. Uh, then the next week, home for the Bills on a Thursday night. Full compliment rest because both teams play on Thanksgiving the week before. We're just going to get pounded by the Bills this year. Loss. At the Arizona Cardinals on a Monday night. Mm, Kyler's probably hurt by then, right? Win. Uh, at the Las Vegas Raiders, you'll probably be staying out uh, west, and uh, that's a that's an NBC Sunday nighter. Ooh, at the Raiders. Raiders are good. Loss. Home for the Cincinnati Bengals and one Joseph Burrow coming to town. Bengals taking a step back. Really, that's a big win right there. Home for the Dolphins. Win. At the Bills. What is the record right now? Uh, you have them at total. I'm at six and four, six and five, six and six, seven and seven, eight, nine and seven. Ooh, this is to get into the playoffs. Bills are resting, guys. Win. Ten and seven. Ten and seven. Chris Brockman has is that the good enough for the seven seed. Seven. You think in the AFC? Uh, it's possible. It depends on how deep the pool is truly in the AFC West. Or if you. With a what's more likely the other day, or was an overreaction saying three teams get out of the AFC North? That was an overreaction, but yeah. If three teams get in from one division, that means there's only one spot available, and the Colts might get it, yeah. and then somebody from the AFC North might get it. You might ten and seven might not ten and might seven not be might good not enough. Make it. But ten wins would be successful this year, given the turnover on the coaching staff. There you go. Trying to be realistic. Well, you had them losing uh, at Minnesota on a Thanksgiving night. I don't know. I think there's all sorts of Belichick ugliness that Cousins might have to. I think it's going to be pretty up and down year. They got that nice stretch before the bye week to kind of get right, and then we'll see what happens. You think the Ravens coming and beat you? Ravens are going to be good. Ravens are going to be good. At the Dolphins. Boy, if the Dolphins start out 1-0 and and two is finding Tyreek Hill and the Patriots just look terrible on offense. And the Same thing Dolphins happened look... last year. Remember, Dolphins came into New England and won week one because uh, Damian Harris fumbled. That's right. Game. So, you know, same thing happened. 10-7. and seven. Okay. I think that's realistic. Yeah, I'm not, Optimistic. I can't do the Jets realistic. one yet. I'm not doing the Jets one yet until I, I find out what's going on in Marina Del Rey with the knee of one BYU Cougar. Yeah, I would say don't count on September. 
Freaking Jets, man. <laughs> it's going to Jets. I literally just muttered the words freaking Jets into a microphone <laughs> that goes beams around the world on YouTube and nationally. You did? On radio. But you, you kept it real, and I think people appreciate that. Now, is that right? I think so. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> let's take a break. We'll take a break. We'll come back. Uh, let's unpack what Shams had to say a little bit about the Nets. By the way, also, yeah. more Shams breaking news. Uh, oh, he, he hung up and broke news? Yeah. Oh, geez. Shams is not for play, Rich. Okay, okay. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. when we A Shams bomb when we come back. Boom. It's J.B. Smooth here at Media Day in Houston, and we're on to the Pats, baby. What's up, Tom? How you doing? You are 10 in the handsome world, right? Would you trade in three of your handsome points to get back at them damn Giants? Yes. i trade them all. Hey, Cuff Brothers, too, man. <laughs> Cuff, hey, Cuff 10 Brothers. Cuff 10 Brothers. You see this? Character, character. Please give me something I can take to these movie executives to convince them why we need a black unicorn movie. You look at this crowd of white unicorns, and all you see is this big, black, handsome unicorn standing there looking like Black Beauty. It's the best strip club in Boston in Gronk's basement. Be honest. <laughs> Am I wrong? I'm going to go down there and talk to your coach, and I'm going to tell that man, this man is, is electrifying. He has to touch the ball way more than that. Okay, I'm gonna go down and tell him. All right, that's on you though. No, don't tell, tell him. No, I, no, I'm gonna say we talked about it. <laughs> nah, you can't tell. No, him wait, wait, wait a minute. Now we did, we did talk about it. She come by my house, my bar, and all I had is black unicorn, and no one wanted because nobody wants that black unicorn. It was different. You're a tough cookie, man. What cookie would that be? A ginger snap, a fig Newton, a vanilla wafer, a chocolate chip cookie. Chocolate Give me chip. a cookie. Yeah, chocolate, chocolate chip, chip all day, all day. I figured that all day. At first, I thought he might be more of a Fig Newton guy, but he's more of a chocolate chip guy. Let's see what happens. Devin or Jason? Devin. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to be honest, man. You got a twin brother who plays for the Titans. Now, how the hell do everybody in here know 
It's you and not damn Jason. There's really no way to tell, though, honestly, because Coach Belichick doesn't even know the difference. I don't want no parent trap stuff going on. No, nah, I'm better than him, so I can't let him go out there and play for me. Can't okay, do that. Jason. She rides that black unicorn. Oh, look, they become man. one. Now, it speaks to us. Now, man, so girl has trouble at home, too. Oh, man. That's a great story, man. And we need Queen, Latif Queen Latifah to be the mom. How many? We shut this place down. For those who might be new here, go down our YouTube wormhole because J.B. Smoove was our Media Day correspondent for five straight Super Bowls, and they were all amazing. Back here on the Rich Eisen Show, Chrome Soft Golf Balls, you should use them. I use them. We all use them whenever we play golf, and yeah, T.J. Yeah. Jefferson's beginning to play golf again, which is just great. It's really great. Yeah. You good over there, TJ? Well, sometimes I know you don't <laughs> like us to talk during the read, so I'm not I mean, sure if uh, I should say anything. Talk, to talk during. You, you make it seem when you say stuff like that, you make it seem like I'm a tyrant. Or, or <laughs> that's one way to look at it. Or it could be like you're reading a sponsored ad, and no, so I know maybe that, I but, shouldn't say but, anything by in the, the window, middle of it. Having a conversation about it is the same thing too. Okay, well that's why I wasn't prepared to speak because I. <laughs> Didn't know you were going to come to me. DJ's back playing golf, and that's all we care about. Same with Callaway. They care about it, too. Hell yeah. Because anytime TJ <laughs> Jefferson is using their product, it means it's a great likelihood Ashton Kutcher is his name. <laughs> wow. <Okay. laughs> How's that for a read? <laughs> wow. Chrome Soft X, Chrome Soft XLS. That's for the players that might be a little bit more advanced than folks like myself or TJ. See, I'm lumping myself in with you. Look at Chrome you. Soft, the regular Chrome Soft, that's what I use for, for a wider range of golfer who wants more distance, better feel, incredible forgiveness. The bottom line is all three uh, of the Chrome Soft golf balls that are offered by Callaway enhanced with precision technology that uses design techniques and manufacturing specifications up to one one thousandth of an inch. This ensures they're the highest quality, most consistent, fastest golf balls possible. When you add it all up, it's pretty simple. Chrome Soft's better for the best and better for everyone. Find out which Chrome Soft is right for you at CallawayGolf.com slash Chrome Soft. A great interviewing technique sometimes is to ask your guest who's in the know for so many different things, is there anything I should know about that I should ask you about? That should be maybe the last question. But it's tough to do that on a radio TV show, you know? Certainly when you've kept an information individual 20 minutes. I know, right? I should have asked that of Shams, huh? We hung up from him and he broke news. What happened? Yeah, we hung up. And so number two overall pick, Chet Holmgren, was playing in a uh, pro-am the other day with LeBron and a bunch of other uh, NBA stars. Up in Washington State, right? There's a fear that Chet Holmgren has suffered ligament damage in his foot. Come on. Undergoing further options. Exams now show potentially torn ligaments in his foot. Timetable being determined based on further evaluation. Is that the dreaded Liz Frank? We've seen Liz Frank uh, shut down NFL Matt players recently. Matt Corral. Travis ATN last year, Matt Corral this year for whole, the whole year. So let's hope not, man, because Chet balled out in summer league and he looked really, really good. And that, you know, that Thunder team's young and exciting. So this would be a major bummer. Oh, my yeah. goodness gracious. Oh, my word. Well, if that happens... Does the Oklahoma City Thunder begin to tank again, like right before the game is even play this year? And how many times can you keep hitting the reset button? Well, Philly did it how many years, TJ? Hmm. Too many? A lot. Yeah. Wow. It's just a bummer. Like, he's such a fun young player. We saw what he could be at Summer League. You know, the spark was there. It's like the potential's there. Well, I, whatever, Man. in our conversation with Shams, he was saying that – based on his knowledge and reporting of the meeting in Los Angeles between Mets Brass and Nets Brass and Durant and Rich Kleiman, that uh, everybody left kind of feeling energized. Everything is all out there on the table. And I, I don't know if Durant was sitting there thinking he wanted out and anybody who's uh, an all-star asks out, they usually get their wish. And you can't even refer to him as an all-star. Durant. He's more than that. No, he's like... He's like a worldwide superstar. 
is second, what he is. Second or third best player in the game right now. And he he asked out, and he didn't get out because the win for management. The Nets. Right? Well, the Nets are like, sure, you can go seek a trade. We'll just make the Asking requirements price, though, yeah. so high that we'll just we we can't do it because we don't think we don't think uh, you're. You're, we, we think so highly of you that we, 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 we don't want to give you away for cheap. Jalen Brown, Derek White, and the number one overall pick in the Nets' mind was cheap. And so what's Durant going to say? Your you're asking price is too high for me? And I guess their answer would be, we covet you so much, Kevin, that we can't take anything less than this. Is that why he wanted Marks out? I mean, there's so much... You know, blank space. There's so many blank spaces to fill in. Yeah. It just, as I said, if you want something in a negotiation, you think you deserve it. You think others have gotten it when you when it's been asked of others in the business. Not maybe you specifically as management, but when somebody has a certain value and is widely believed industry-wide to be the best, if not one of the best. And that person doesn't get what they want. And it's presented them, well, here's the fait accompli. You either come back or you start, you hold your, out your services and we don't want that. Clearly, we think this is the best chance for you to win. You're the best chance for us to win. Let's get together. Let's combine forces again that it's presented as a fait accompli, like you're not going anywhere. We covet you that much. Even though you could say covet you that much, it doesn't It doesn't sink in. They're, they're, I, I, I just know I've been in these positions before. There's a certain resentment. Now, when you start going through your business and start doing your job that you do love so much, you forget about it. But when the going gets tough and it happens again, where you feel like whatever promises you were given, assurances you were given aren't met. That's the thing I'm going to keep an eye out for this year, man. With him and the Nets. And if Kyrie decides to show up to work. Well, he's got, I mean, I don't know he's we, got to do anything anymore. We, I have no we don't idea. know what's going to happen. I mean, they, what they still, a weird you know, team, man. They have this potentially great big three. They've never played together. We have no idea what it's going to look like. That's right. We have no idea what it's going to look like. Right? Zero. Zero. Is Ben Simmons going to be what we think he might, could be? Like before it kind of all went south in Philadelphia? Like, I have no idea. And I must send out an apology. Not that he'll care or maybe even hear it, but... We've mentioned a couple times here on the show as fact that Ben Simmons left a text chat amongst the entire Nets team (laughs) uh, prior to game four against the Celtics saying, hey, we need you tonight. And he left the chat conversation. Shams called that 100% false for Pinocchios. Uh, And we mentioned that around here as fact. And he would know. Well, he would know. He would know. He's got everything, you know, every Brooklyn story he breaks, so. He's got connections there, obviously. I wanted that to be true. <laughs> it just would have been funny. <laughs> so there's all of that. What a fun show today. For those uh, who missed it, we had Arthur Smith on an hour one. He's already locked in. He didn't really give us much on what's going <laughs> nah, on with the he season. Was mid-season he's form, locked man. in, man. I, I think he loves Mariota, and I think he's going to – I think the offense will be better than people think. Drake London, I asked him if he'll be ready for week one. He said he didn't have a – he said uh, he couldn't predict the future. I told him, you should just tell me you don't have a crystal ball. He told me to ask Vrabel if he has a crystal ball, that Vrabel loves making predictions. Well, I have a feeling crazy, he's leading me down a, a path there. That crazy draft photo, you know, from Vrabel's house, there could have easily been a picture, uh, a crystal ball in the background been. of that picture. Could have been. You know? Um, also the director, Michael Mann of heat and now the author of the bestseller heat Two, said he wants to make that into a movie as well. And told some great backstories of the movie heat. If you missed it, youtube.com slash rich Eisen show. Same with Devin McCourty 
of the Patriots who we just hung up from, and also Shams. And in case you missed it, Joey Chestnut will be in Wrigley Field tonight and has agreed to use a hot dog as a straw rather than just trying to eat 75 of them in a <laughs> short period of time. Yes. The greatest hot dog eater, the most famous hot dog eater on planet Earth. Most famous eater, period. Says he will, in fact, make a hole through a hot dog, use it as a beer straw, and send out the video tagging us. Thank God. We call that a win. <laughs> Fly the W in Wrigley Field tonight. We're back on the Rich Eisen Show on the radio tomorrow. If you're at Wrigley tonight, too, by the way, and you see Joey Chestnut, just start filming. Just take your phone out. Just do the thing. Just get video of him. He said he's engaged Say again is up. what he said. Do you think it's the same person or is it a different individual? I did hear that again in there. Sounded like a different person. I mean, he kind of laughed a little said negativity it. there. Oh, you think so? Yeah. Kind of, it was kind of like again. Jay and Felly, you've, you've done a lot of weird things in real life. Have you ever been engaged? Uh, I thought so once. I woke up uh, next to someone and we had rings on. Our last calls had been to some chapels. Uh... They didn't answer, luckily. Who, the chapel didn't answer? Chapel didn't answer, so we were Was that in Las Vegas, Nevada? It was in Tahoe. Okay. (laughs) Answer your question. Very good. (laughs) A lot of beer straws that night. (laughs) Yep. Hot dog beer straw. Hashtag it. Oh, baby. That is tonight. So you'll be on the lookout for that, right, TJ? No. What do you mean, no? The Mets are off tonight. I know. So I got to take a day off myself. But last night was these last couple of days were stressful baseball. I know that you know, Mets lead over the Braves down to two. Oh, Sarah's very happy. <laughs> very, very down happy. to two. Was she rooting for the Yankees actually the last couple of nights for the first time in a long time? Yeah, and yeah. I, something happened in the game where I was just like, "Please get a hit here or something," and it was it might have been for Alonzo, and she's like, "What are you talking about?" I'm like, "I don't want the Yankees to win ever." Yeah. I mean, with all due respect to your team. <laughs> and I respect you, sir. Like, I respect you. Like I root you. for two teams, the I Red res- Sox and who's ever playing the Yankees. I respect Some you on that front. Cross, I, like, I respect you on that front, and, and that sort of spite will help keep you warm in October as you watch other people play baseball. Yeah. It'll be great. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm already looking at the 2023 schedule that's out. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Who's going to be your starting pitcher in we, uh, uh, first week? No idea. Uh, hopefully, is, it's, is Dever, hopefully it's w- Nick Pavetta. Is Devers going to be paid or not? I I mean, honestly, I have no idea. Nick Pavetta, I that's who you so. want to be your opening day starter next He's year? our best pitcher right now. Guy's a, guy's a horse. Oh, he turned it around because Coop and I dropped him a few weeks oh, ago. Oh, he's been great. Yeah, he's been great. I don't know. It's going to be great, though. Uh, Aaron Judge's return to Yankee Stadium is June 9th. Oh, you said, was that when the San Francisco Giants are in? Uh, that's when the Red Sox play, though. Or the Yankees. Yeah, right. That, 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 that will happen when a spot, very warm spot, freezes over. You keep on... <laughs> Warming your heart by that fire, sir. I saw people tweeting out the Giants, like, judges return to Yankee Stadium. Got it. <laughs> Got it. 48 and counting for 99. Is he going to get 61, you think? I don't know. It's been a rough go lately. He's only one off but pace they've got, right now, right? They've got four against the A's and then three against the yeah. uh, the Artie Morenos. So we'll see. But he still has a week left in August, and he's uh, he's got like the – Third or fourth most home runs ever before before the end of August. Well, that'll wrap it up for this edition of the Rich Eisen Show. We greatly appreciate it. We'll see you right back here on our YouTube stream on Thursday. Once again, once uh, once, uh, again, we're on YouTube until the Roku channel. And this show begins to stream together on in September. And we will be free on all Roku devices, Samsung Smart TV, Fire TV. You can download the Roku app. And uh, on the mobile device, the Roku channel is free there. And the same thing at theRokuChannel.com. We will chat with you on Thursday.